Hello, and welcome to episode 16 of the God Cells podcast. I am Eric Marola. This podcast is much different than the ones I've uh, sent out in the past. I speak to Paul from Texas, who, at least for now, is the last American to have received fetal stem cell therapy before Putin decided to indiscriminately carpet bomb the country of Ukraine. I want to remind anyone listening to this that fetal stem cell therapy worldwide, anywhere on planet Earth, is now on hold due to Putin's actions. And do not, under any circumstances, go to Stem Cell of America in Tijuana, Mexico, thinking that you're going to receive fetal stem cells. You will not receive them. They ran out of them in the middle of my investigation into them and fetal stem cell therapy. You will receive DMSO preservative mixed with saline solution at best. I need to remind everyone again that Stem Cell of America had not then and does not now have a source for fetal stem cell therapy. They do not have a source of fetal stem cells. The stem cells they once had were stolen in the mid-1990s by William Rader, stolen from M-cell. They stole a batch of liver cells and they stole a batch of neuronal cells, which is only two cell types of the 24 cell types that M-cell offers as their therapy. This can be very evident in video shown of anyone getting the injections in Tijuana, Mexico at Stem Cell of America because the cells being injected into the bloodstream are clear. As of 2015, all of the liver cells were clear, meaning they weren't liver cells. Maybe they're just saline solution. We really don't know. But if you decide to go to Stem Cell of America thinking you're going to get fetal stem cells, just understand you're going to be ripped off. It is not available anywhere else in the world, outside of the walls of M-cell, the amount of cost and expertise to get fetal material within the quickest amount of time to the lab, harvest it, test it for all bacteria and viruses, sort the cells, separating them out from heart, from liver, from lung, from kidney, is a humongous undertaking. Not to mention suspending them in time, preserving their viability. No other laboratory on earth is doing this, except for M-Cell. The M-Cell laboratory and M-Cell clinic still stands. Its stem cell bank is currently being preserved. And as of now, there is hope, once Putin is defeated, that their operation can continue and people from around the world can continue to get this therapy. My new documentary, which you'll hear me talk a little bit about in this podcast, was well into production. I finished all of the filming after two to three years of traveling the world around the United States, filming patients. I did an extremely deep dive into the science of this, helping the viewer understand that all other stem cell therapies are far inferior and I dare say a waste of your time, unless you're trying to just simply fix a sports injury, but any sort of neurological condition using adult blood cells or umbilical cord cells is a waste of time for the sheer fact that no blood cell after being injected back into a human can transform into a neuronal cell. So when you see advertisements for adult cells or umbilical cells advertised for treatment of autism or Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, please understand that it is a little bit of a bait and switch because people don't understand what stem cells are, much less understanding their differences. You cannot fix a neurological condition because it cannot be regenerated without neuronal cells. And the only place you can get a neuronal cell or a colony of neuronal cells is through fetal material. And before you email me and ask me about induced pluripotent stem cells or scientists that take adult cells and transform them into neuronal cells in a lab before injection, nope, doesn't work either because those are pre-cultivated cells that have already been pre-proliferated. In other words, their potential has been wasted in a Petri dish. And then these doctors boast how they're injecting 200 million or whatever cells into you Again, again, it's another sales pitch. It's another bait and switch. If you already proliferate and cultivate the cells in a lab, sure, it looks great under a microscope, but it really does no good after injection, no significant good. The proliferation and cultivation part has to happen after injection, after being inserted into the body. 
Fetal material is the only stem cell type worth your time. If you are talking about treating any sort of neurological condition or any major immunological condition, the same goes for heart cells. Blood cells can't just magically transform into a heart cell after injection. Blood cells are blood cells. They can transform into tendons and muscles and maybe a little bit of cartilage, but they cannot magically transform into an organ cell because if they did, none of us would get sick. Our own stem cells would do that job for you. And trying to grow them in a lab and giving them back to you, it's better than nothing, but it's providing really nothing more than false hope. So moving on, my conversation with Paul is nearly two hours. If you have the time to listen to the whole thing, he discusses his journey getting out of Ukraine right as the invasion began. And instead of explaining what happened, I'll just let you listen to the podcast. As always, if you need to ask me any questions about this or need some clarification on what I open the podcast with, you can email me at eric at ericmarola.com. I have no plans to return to Ukraine until the invasion has subsided. There are many question marks about the fate of Ukraine as a country and the fate of fetal stem cells in general. But as long as everything still stands in regards to the clinic, there is still hope to hold on to. And in case you're wondering about my perspective on what is going on with uh, Mr. Putin and the current state of affairs in the world, remember I'm a journalist and I do deep dives on subjects. And if you've seen any of my documentaries, I really go in full force. And personally, I think Putin is currently the most dangerous man on earth. And as I watch people continue to go on with their lives in the United States, for example, not thinking this is going to affect them as long as Putin still breathes, I hope I'm wrong. And I understand we are basing a lot of this on speculation and belief, but speculating and believing, we speculate and believe we can drive to the store safely and return home. But hey, something could happen. You could get hit by a truck. What I'm getting at is, if Putin isn't stopped, he's going to continue beyond Ukraine. If anyone thinks this is exclusively about NATO, and I have actually drank the Kool-Aid on Putin claiming it's about NATO, I believe that is incorrect. Putin's plan is to rebuild the former USSR. And it is impossible to rebuild the USSR without also bombing NATO territory. So as we sit back thinking that we don't want to provoke Putin into World War III, as long as he still breathes, or unless his population rises up and takes him down, which is our really greatest hope, unless the CIA has some really clever plan to just take this guy out, I believe that World War III has already started. I mean, World War II went on for years. We're only a month into this. Europe was being bombarded by Hitler for years before America got involved. Putin is not one to lose. Putin will go full force. He will not surrender. And he's the kind of person that will take everyone down with him before he loses. He has carried on through with every threat he has made so far. And just give it some thought. Do you think he won't use a nuclear weapon? I do. And I certainly don't think he needs the NATO excuse to do it. I hope you enjoy today's podcast with Paul from Texas. One last thing real quick, in case you're watching this on YouTube, instead of editing in the videos he talks about during my interview, I am going to throw the videos in right now. This is a photo of Paul at MCell during his therapy. Here is the video through the windshield of Paul's van, noticing what appears to be either National Guard or regular citizens unloading their machine guns. Here is Paul on foot with his two Belarusian friends as a refugee. Saturday, the 26th, February, 2022, Ukraine. 
I'm officially a refugee. First time in my entire life. Nick, first time for you to be a refugee? Yeah. Alex? Yeah, for sure. My Belarusian buddies. <laughs> the line is almost eight miles long, going to the border crossing. We're walking, and uh, let's see what happens when we get there. And this is what the border looks like when he arrived to Romania. Hey, Eric. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Not bad. How are you doing? Oh, living the dream, buddy. <laughs> 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 awesome yeah so I mean clearly as I said I kind of wanted to hold off speaking to you before we could maybe sort of uh, get it on the record which you're gracious enough to do and frankly I think you're the last American to have ever been treated um, <laughs> not funny at all but uh, I should get some award or something then huh <laughs> I, think, I think escaping with the successful therapy and your life is uh, award enough maybe. yeah you're right you're right I don't want to be <laughs> and one I don't be too greedy <laughs> right and honestly one hell of a story to tell which i'm sure this is partly why i wanted to talk to you you're literally other than ukrainians i know on the ground that live there but yeah so i mean you basically let's run through the timeline so you were you contacted me like a week and a half before all of this i was like look if you're gonna go just go now i think this is highly unlikely uh, I think you said, you said something like, I have nothing else to lose. I mean, anyway, right. You're, you were literally like, I, this sucks so bad having this neuropathy. You arrived on a Saturday or a Sunday, right? I arrived on a, on Sunday. It was, uh, what was it? The 19th, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Or no, oh, I actually left on the 19th, arrived on the 20th, which was Sunday. That's right. And then, yeah. And then my treatment was the, uh, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then, um, uh, I was supposed to leave, uh, that Thursday and ac actually, um, oh geez, Max picked me up and we were on our way to the airport and he says, uh, wow, traffic is unusually heavy. Yeah. And, uh, cause it was early in the morning, you know, and, and I go, yeah, that is odd, isn't it? And he says, yeah. So we get to the airport and there's a, uh, there's a police, uh, blocking the road and, uh, it's like airports closed. And that's when I was like, okay, I got to figure some shit out now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Had you known that the invasion had begun at that point or is it just. No, yeah. no, um, not at all. And it was, it was, uh. You know, there was no really media going out because it was, I think it was about six o'clock in the morning. And I, I don't think the invasion started in, until like uh, two or between two and four in the morning. So it was, it didn't, it didn't spread uh, that fast. And, and um, uh, I obviously, you know, most people are sleeping. So s social media is, is, you know, down for the most part, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. That's, so yeah, yeah. It's all coming back to me now. So, of course, you're texting me trying to see about getting a driver. Um, you know, I did try, you know, for that. And honestly, I, you know, thought it was going to be easier than that. But everybody was sort of scrambling, protecting their own lives and their own families once things started rolling throughout that day and the next day. Yeah, I'd love to hear because I never really got a full understanding of I, all I know is that you got away at some portion of your journey out on foot with a couple of Belarusian guys uh, into Romania but if you don't mind, I'd love to hear sort of like how you got out of there. Because I because I didn't hear from you. I even contacted the hotel where you were staying, the senator. And they were like, yeah, he checked out yesterday. You know, we hope he's okay. It's so like, fuck. You know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I came back, uh, you know, Max Driver, he was a good, he was a good guy. And, yeah. and he goes, would you want me to drop you off at a hotel by the airport? And I was kind of thinking, um, well, I'm like, I, I don't know how soon this thing's going to be op over, you know? So I'm like, I don't think I'm going to probably be flying out of this place. Right. And, um, you know, 
it, at that time I didn't know anything, but I was just trying to trying to make the best rational decision going down step by step of you know what I could do. So I said, you know what? I know everyone at the senator. Take me back to the senator. And uh, so we called, and uh, they had my room still. Obviously, I don't think anyone was checking in. Yeah. And uh, so I went back to my room, and and then I guess just, uh, you know, I do a lot of hunting and stuff like that. So a little bit of survival kind of kicked in. I was like, well, I got to get some food and, and some some water and whatever. So town was empty. I mean, literally empty but they have these little markets open and what have you. And I went and got some water and, and, um, you know, just some food to stay alive, non-perishable stuff. And, and, uh, I came back and actually they cooked me breakfast there at the Senator. I brought them a couple dozen eggs because they ran out of eggs. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, they were really super nice people. So oh, yeah, they always have been. I, I w- yeah. yeah. You know, I, I wasn't, especially Thursday, I really wasn't worried, it, it, you know. So the city's kind of like on lockdown a little bit, and it wasn't anything, un, you know, not not normal. So, sure. um, and then there was uh, there were some people in there, and kind of got talking in the lobby, and could tell that panic was kind of setting in with everyone, and and uh, and. Uh, you know, everyone's trying to flee, and you notice that there, are, you know, the traffic in Kiev is is uh, pretty outrageous. Uh, parking all over the streets yeah. and sidewalks because there's no room, right? Yeah, it's bad on a well, normal day. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's bad on a normal day. So when you start looking outside and there's no vehicles around, and okay, then I started thinking, well, I'm probably not going to get a ride out of here. <laughs> because everyone's gone, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Everyone's gone that's that's leaving it. I don't really know anyone. So then um, I went to bed Thursday, woke up Friday, and, uh, you know, I was trying to look at some train schedules to see if I could take a train out. But the the Metro subway was running, but the, you know, long distance trains were all shut down to conserve fuel. Right. So, um, that wasn't an option. And, uh, and then I went down for in the morning Friday and, um, I don't know, people were just really kind of freaking out. The hotel staff was packing up and, and, uh, going to their families out in the country and, you know, it, it was, it was different. So, uh, that's when I kind of decided, Hey, I, I probably got to find a way out of here before there's no one left in Kiev. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, I started checking some things and, uh, uh, you know, my wife's freaking out. I was going to ask, how was your family doing uh, during all of this? I bet your wife is so pissed at me for encouraging you to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, she wasn't mad at anyone. She was just, you know, freaking out. Like, uh, how am I going to get you home? You know? But, sure. Um, no, mine would be the same. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, so she puts all kinds of stuff on Facebook and, and, uh, and uh and social media all over the place and and um so some friends of mine uh sent me this link to uh, what was the name um project dynamo right okay and uh i'm not i'm not i'm not kind of a person that uh like wants help or anything. I like you know, doing things funny. on my own. It was funny. I gathered that from you. I was like, huh? Like, I'm surprised. Like, I, I did obviously look, try to help get drivers for you, but I just didn't, first of all, to be honest, I didn't anticipate this even happening. I really did not believe in a million years this was actually going to happen. And of course, everybody was, like I said, protecting everybody. Then I was, and you were like, you were like unusually quiet. I would text you. I wouldn't hear back. I'm like, sure hope he's okay. 
And then I gathered, yeah, I, re- I should figure that out. I was like, this is clearly guys, this guy's clearly got, you know, his head on straight. He's a pretty independent. He's going to take care of this, I think. But go ahead, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was, it was funny. It was, I, I, I didn't expect it to happen either. I really, I'm thinking, what are the odds they've built up there for the last X amount of months, year, whatever. And I didn't think it was going to happen, you know, either. But it was funny when I, when I flew in, you know, my, flight got canceled in before I even left and then I had to book another one. And then when I got to the airport an hour before I was supposed to leave, my flight out was canceled. And I said, eh, I'll find a way out. Yeah. Worst case scenario, I'll take a train to po- to Warsaw or whatever the case is, right? Yeah, that's right. We did talk about that. We, uh, MSL was trying to give advice on trains, either to Warsaw or Prague. All right, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, uh, when I got there, uh, the, uh, customs guy, the Ukrainian customs guy, I give him my passport and everything. And, and he looks at me with a funny look and I don't speak Ukrainian. And as soon as I, he's seen it was the United States, he picks up the phone and he starts, uh, speaking to, uh, I'm assuming his supervisor or whatever. And then, uh, he hangs up the phone and he, he says, um, uh, are you a tourist? And I go, well, I'm getting some medical procedures done. And uh, he looks at me, he goes, right now? I said, well, yeah, in the next three days. He goes, good luck. And he handed it back. <laughs> <laughs> so that should have been a sign, you know? <laughs> oh, my God. That was on the way in. Wow. Okay. Yeah, because I've, I've literally been there 30 times, and I've never had anybody speak to me. Um, yeah, that's huge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, uh, so it was it was Friday, and so I started, I'm like, well, I got to kind of think about this. I didn't want to, you know, my wife's calling the embassy, and, and, you know, she's freaking out. I said, Susie, relax. I said, I took videos, you know, CNN, I, I have a video, CNN's um, describing Kiev as getting bombed and all this stuff, and... I'm walking down the streets. No one's on the streets. Mm-hmm. You know, we're just walking down there. There's no explosions. There's nothing. So I said, just relax. Don't, don't, you know, freak out about what you see on TV, you know? Yeah. So, um, and then, uh, so she had a customer in, in her work and she didn't sleep very well. And so she looked really Probably, I'm not going to say this. She looked, she looks beautiful all the time, but um, she probably didn't look too good that day. <laughs> okay. So the customer said, "What's wrong?" And she said, "My husband's stuck in the uh, in uh, the Ukraine." And the lady was like, "Oh my God, fill out this paperwork right here." So it was to that Project Dynamo. That was the second time. So I didn't even know my wife filled it out. My wife just filled it out and sent it in, and. Uh, I got a call Saturday morning and um, I seen it was a 516 area code and I'm like, oh, just another spam call. Yeah, you know like, what I mean? Like- yeah, it's, oh, it's New York or Tampa. I can't remember where they're from. Okay. It's one of the two. But, um, and I'm like, I'm not going to answer it. I'm like, well, hey, I ain't got nothing else to do. I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> 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 So I answered this phone call, and it's this lady. Um, oh, geez, oh, Pete, what was her name? Oh, Olivia. And um, Olivia was the husband of Brian, who runs this this project, Dynamo. And he's an ex-military guy. And uh, what he does is he goes to these countries. Um, because really, ultimately, you pay your taxes your entire life. And I know they told me not to go there, but... You know, you pay your taxes all year, all, all the time, and they won't even let you go to the embassy, right? You know, I mean, it's like you're, you're a peon. So, yeah, my wife, my this guy started this project to get Americans, Canadians, uh, UK members, citizens, and uh, a few other countries, uh, like out of these worn torn countries. This, I think, one of his first projects was Afghanistan. Okay, and. Um, so anyways, this lady calls me and she says, uh, I need a picture of your passport and, uh, uh, and I'll call you back and tell you where to be within the hour. 
And uh, I was like, okay. I'm like, do you know where we're going? She goes, I can't tell you. I'm like, well, I mean, I'm, I don't want to really go on a tour of the Ukraine. You know, I'd like to know where we're going. Right. Uh, so um, I sent her a picture of my passport. She calls me back in 10 minutes and says, be to this location within an hour and there'll be a bus there. And uh, so I went and oh, I forgot the girl's name at the counter. Super, super nice girl. And um, I said, you know, because I don't have any, they use different, they don't use Uber and Lyft over there. They use like uh, Buzz or something else like that. I, I didn't have any of that information. Yeah. So she, she called me a car and uh, it was, uh, the, the rate was like 300 and something Grievna. And then um, I said, just put 500 Grievna down or, or I told her to put 750 down. She put 500 down. No one took it. I go, just put a thousand down. <laughs> thousand grievna is like thirty four dollars. Yeah. I'm like, who cares, right? Yeah. And uh, so some some kid took it, and they had a couple uh, military guys outside the hotel that were patrolling the street. They were like uh, reserves or something, driving their own vehicles, mm-hmm. which was fairly odd to me. I, I look at all these reserves and what have you, and they're driving their own vehicles around town, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and then they're getting out with their 1960s AKs, and I'm thinking to myself, and they only had like five mags per person. I know which is 100. Is that one of the 150 rounds? <laughs> okay, yeah. Is that one of the videos you sent me? The guys getting out of their car carrying machine guns. Is that what that was? Well, that was uh, on my way out of town. Okay. But yeah, that was that was that was actually the. I wouldn't even say reserves. That was the volunteer forces. Okay. Um. Yeah. That that did that yeah they have a little transit van and they they pack them in the back like a, a like like a coyote smuggling them and they all get out okay <laughs> it was uh, it was different but so uh those guys stopped my driver and i was like no he's my driver and they're like okay you know and, and so he, you know i i'm not a very trusting person i always like um i always uh try to think of uh um I don't know. I, I don't have a lot of faith in humanity much. Anymore. <laughs> so I always, th- I'm thinking, is this kid, is this guy going to drop me off somewhere? Because none of the streets, you can't tell they're, they're written in, in Ukrainian. Right. right. Even though like on the map, they'll say they'll kind of be broken down in English. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't tell. So I did see a picture of the building and it said 40, it was 46 dash two or 42 dash six. And I was like, well, I must be in the right spot. So he got me there, but you could see him reinforcing all the waterways, the bridges and everything with, with troops. And, uh, so I got there and Excuse me. there was, I want to say a total of, uh, 10 of us. And, uh, there was, uh, uh, Belar- two from Belarus. One had a Canadian passport. One had a Belarus passport. Then there was, uh, one, well, the rest of us were American. Yeah. But, you were um, the only American? No, the rest of us were Americans. Oh, okay. So there's eight, eight, eight other Americans, <laughs> but only four of us spoke English. There, are the other four or five of us spoke English. Excuse me. Uh, the other, the other three were, I believe, were initially Ukrainian citizens that got citizenship to the U.S. Sometime they were they're older people. Okay. And uh, so we all, after some. Uh, language barrier we all found out where this bus was going and and what have you and got on the bus and it was a uh it was a 30 hour trip to um to all the traffic and the um uh, uh checkpoints and everything going on there so wow and the so- roads are if, if you're not on the freeway the roads are terrible there you know so overall, thirty hours. So obviously, people had to stop and pee and stuff like that. I mean, was... uh, we only stopped and peed, I think, three times. Okay, something like that. So once... Yeah, but the driver, the driver did take a few naps because he was driving straight through, and then he was saying he was having blood pressure problems and his vision was getting blurry, and it was, and the van was breaking down. So I didn't really think we were at, really. I figured I was going to be humping it. 
<laughs> wow. So what do you mean the van was breaking down just because of the stop and starting? The van was having issues? Uh, he was losing power for the last probably about four hours we were driving. We were doing like 20 miles an hour up hills. He said the intercooler, but I think it had something to do with like the uh, turbo or the um, uh, uh, diff uh, stuff where it gets plugged up in the exhaust. But anyways, okay. yeah, it was, it was not, uh, you know, it was not great. But we went... Uh, I know I'm going to say this town right, but we finally got to this town, uh, Cherninsky, I believe it was. It's about 25 kilometers from uh, the border of Romania. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a resort there that has a hotel and a lake and saunas and and uh, what have you and a restaurant. And we met Brian there. And Brian actually, uh, they provided us with dinner. I was, I was pleasantly surprised. They, they had a nice dinner there. So I'm sorry, who's, um, who's Brian? He's the person that with the organization. Yeah. With, with the organization. Now his wife's in Tampa, Florida, Olivia, mm -hmm. and they have other volunteers and Brian actually got to the Ukraine, I think just the day before. Um, but he is in the Western side of the Ukraine. I mean, quite a few hours. Okay. Uh, away from Kiev, like in all actuality, I think the trip should have only took us about eight eight hours, um, but it just because everything took us thirty hours. Right. So and this was a free um, service, right? This, or did you have to pay for this? <clears throat> uh, I paid two hundred and fifty bucks to the bus driver. Okay, yeah, that I mean worth it, sure. obviously. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, it's yeah. worth it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and I think, you know, he was basically is you know everything runs off of donations, so. He just didn't have any donations. We're only the second bus out, right? Okay. So I don't think he I don't believe that he had any donations to to fund the fund the bus. But you know, he did buy us dinner and um, you know, he was doing his best to give us information uh of you know what to expect at the border, right? Mm -hmm. And um even though he didn't have any information on the other side of the border, uh, which was, you know, my concern. Uh, mm -hmm. there was a pat, there was a pastor and a couple missionaries on the bus that did some, uh, Bible school thing here in the Ukraine. And, and, um, they had, uh, one of the pastors from Romania coming to pick them up. The, the guy rented a bus and then they were going to go back to his church, spend a couple of days there and then go to Bucharest, which was like, uh, another seven or eight hour ride and then they were going to fly out of Bucharest but um uh I, that was my plan initially when I got on the bus um and then my the only means of communication I had my sim card didn't work in the Ukraine that must so be why there was those dead periods where I couldn't get a hold of you right yeah okay yeah that that was probably it all I could do was text my mm -hmm. MMS or SMS worked but but the uh, but the cell coverage or my internet didn't work unless I got a you know Wi-Fi. But on the road, you're not you're not getting any Wi-Fi. So right. Um, but uh, during that time, uh, it was crazy. So my my youngest son played AAA hockey for the longest time and and uh, played with this kid um, whose parents. Uh, oh, gee, it's it's way down the line. So it, my son played hockey with this kid whose parents were friends with this Romanian couple and uh, from, from this private school they went to. And um, so they called them and said, hey, do you know anyone in Romania? And they're like, no, but my friend does. So they called this other Romanian family, right? Mm -hmm. And the guy, the guy's <clears throat> in California. And he goes, yeah, my, uh, my, my sister and my brother-in-law live right at the border there. It's called, a, I'm going to say it wrong, Sitka, something like that. Okay. And, and, um, uh, and I was like, my wife was like, you got to be out of, you, you got to be crazy. So they all got out of. <laughs> what do you mean? You can, why did she say that? Wait a minute. What, what did she mean by I, that? I mean, I mean, who, I mean, like if you just threw it out there and said, you know, what's the chances of somebody living on the border of Romania where oh, her I husband's see. Fl got fleeing it. to? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, these people were probably, I, I guess they're around a, 
early sixties. And, um, so, uh, you know, I had been in contact with the, they didn't speak English very well. So I've been in contact with the, with the brother-in-law that lives in California and, um, super nice people. I mean, just, I mean, that actually restored some faith in humanity for me. You know what I mean? I've just, I, to to think that there's people still out there like this, how how nice they were and 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 how caring they were and everything, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I told him, I'm like, hey, I'm in this Chuninsky. Um, the driver's going to take a nap. We're all eating, uh, and then we're going to get dropped off. We're going to get taken to the border. Uh, I think we're leaving at ten o'clock, so it'll probably won't we won't be there until about eleven. And I go, but I don't think it's going to be a very quick border crossing so tell your you know tell your brother-in-law um just to stay home sleep do whatever he's got to do and uh i'll call him when i get across the you know i'll text you when i get across the border because i don't want to wait in there all night you know i mean it was so so uh the guy wouldn't take no for an answer so he shows up there at like 11 30 at night and he waited until seven in the morning for us. Wow! Uh, for, for for me, and um, he he I he was texting me and he says, "I have sign with your name on it," and I put flashlight flash it on the sign, you know. And uh, so we finally get across the border, uh, it, and that was probably the craziest part. Like um, there's just masses of people at the border. If I had to guess, I mean, there was a line of cars and trucks. Uh, I think about 12 to 14 kilometers back from the border on the road, just bumper to bumper okay. and uh, trying to get, trying to get through. And then um, we, our van drove up along the side of the road about five kilometers out. And then the road got narrow and he couldn't drive up the side of the road anymore. So he's we we're like, well, we're just going to walk. So we got the backpack on and I pulled my, suitcase thing my little suitcase uh and um me and uh, me and a few other guys we all walked together up to the up to the uh uh up to the border crossing you know but <clears throat> during that time when brian was talking to us the guy from project dynamo he was telling us that you know some of the use these ukrainians mm-hmm. got smart to this and they're on the side of the road uh waiting for you because they know everyone's got all their cash and jewelry and stuff. And the one thing about America is, you know, you always have um, a means to protect yourself, you know? Yeah. And uh, I had nothing there, right? I mean, I literally had nothing and I had just had shoulder surgery about mm, four or five months previous. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like weak in my dominant shoulder and so at the restaurant, I feel bad, but I stole a couple of their butter knives. <laughs> <laughs> hey. stuck, stuck them in my pocket. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we got to the border, and, and uh, Wait, we didn't me, have any problems. I'm going to stop you for a second. So two things I want to ask. First of all, at the video you sent me at night with two Belarusian guys, you're walking down the road. Have you talked about that portion of the journey yet? <clears throat> no, I'm, get, I'm okay. getting to that. Okay, got well, it. Yeah. That's fine. I know. Yeah, I, I, so, I just want to make sure. And then hold on. So you were warned or you you just had a gut feeling that some of the like, some some people might try, have tried to rob you. Like, what? explain that again, if you don't mind. Well, uh, yeah, Brian warned us that there was some, uh, you know, some Ukrainians that figured, hey, they're going to make a little bit of money off of this and whatever. There mm-hmm. is reports of it, right? Okay. And, that, you know, so that and, and then I, I thought kind of myself, you know, I've seen um, I've seen countries that have that have fallen and you look at the border crossings and they get a little bit wild. Right. Sure. You know, I mean, people cl- climbing over everyone and what have you. Yeah. Um, so that's why I kind of grabbed those butter knives. Sure. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. But so, uh, you know, I walked with all the people. Uh, you know, me and me and the two other Belarusian, we, we were kind of on the younger, I mean, I'm 50, but we were on the younger side. Right. And, um, so wait a minute, uh, forgive me. Cause I didn't mean to make you jump so far ahead. So, but you were in the van, you had dinner and you were going to try to get to Romania. Like, yeah. How, how did you suddenly end up on the road with these guys at night? Like what, what well, happened? Th- those Belarusian guys were with me. 
Oh, right? in the van. In the van. Got yeah. it. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So it was myself and the two Belar- Belarus uh, people from Belarus. And then it was the rest. Everyone else was all old. I mean, over the, well, I'm going to say old, but definitely over the, the age of 60. I'd say probably at least 65 ish. Okay. And so we kind of like walked with them up <clears throat> to the border. So nothing happened to them. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, and then uh, this, the, the one lady that was with us didn't, um, she didn't really speak English and she didn't want to like listen to us and her and her husband disappeared and we were worried about them. And, um, we seen him on the other side after we, d- we did get on the other side, but, okay. uh, yeah, so it, it wasn't too bad. It was, uh, there was some pushing and shoving and, and there was some, um, uh, you know, dramatic people that were in panic and what have you, but it wasn't as bad as what I've seen before, you know, mm-hmm. um, with, with, uh, people climbing over you. We did get lucky though. We were in this line and this, it was, it was very odd because it looked like the people were hired to help organize things, but they had no uniforms or anything. And, um, so these people were just walking around yelling, telling the cars to go here, go get there, people to go here, people to go there. There were no lines. It was just a crowd at a gate. And so we got over to the right hand side and, and, um, this guy come up, he was dressed fairly well and he had a, uh, uh, a leather European bag, like slung over his shoulder. And he said, this line is for locals, Ukrainian people only. And so I said, uh, Hey, where's the line for everyone else? Like he goes, who are you, you know, where are, where are you from? And I said, the U S we're all from the U S he goes, you're local. You stay right here. Okay. So, so I was like, well, it was, it was, it was, you know, that was one of the times it worked out being from the U S sure. <laughs> so, uh, we got across the border, waited in the van for about three hours because you have to go through, um, uh, passport control from the Ukraine, leaving the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And then they, they just come on the bus, take everyone's passport and uh, make sure everything's good and to, to let you out of the country. They did, they did kick one guy off the bus because they have a, um, they passed some kind of bail or whatever it was, temporary law that said uh, no Ukrainian male from the ages of 18 to 60 yeah. can leave the country. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was there was one hour, one on our bus, and I don't know what the the lady passport control agent was saying, but it sure looked like she was shaming them. And uh, sure. she pulled them off. She pulled them off, and uh, they had to walk back and and what have you. But when we got to Romania, um, you know, they just did a quick passport check, and they realized, you know, they didn't ask you anything because they they know why you're coming into Romania, you know. Yeah. So, um. And then uh, I got off the bus in Romania, and uh, uh, I texted the guy in California, tell him as, to tell his brother-in-law that I was uh, I was just in, you know, coming across the the, the border. And um, uh, I get off the bus and I throw my backpack on and I turn around and I see this guy <laughs> holding a flashlight. And uh, he's got my name on this piece of cardboard. <laughs> and uh, I guess he was talking to to uh, one of the Romanian police officers on the other side. And the guy said, you got to back up. Uh, you're never going to find him. Just back up. Go <laughs> find him back there, you know. Right. And I, we walked up and he gave me a big hug and everything. And the Romanian police officer was <clears> like, that's that's unbelievable. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so um, you know, I told everyone bye, and and uh, we we exchanged numbers before that, and um, uh, uh, I told everyone bye, and went and got in this Volkswagen Passat diesel, mm-hmm. and uh, I actually felt safer in the Ukraine than I did driving with this guy. Okay, wow. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I make that joke, but <clears throat> but um, he. He 
wanted to drive like Mario Andretti, but yeah. his skills were like, um, you know, uh, a 14 a, a year old driver. <laughs> wow. Okay. He was, he was, he was flying through these back roads of Romania, uh, at like, you know, six o'clock in the morning or whatever. And, uh, and we were missing corners. We we're in the gravel. We're in the other lane. And oh man, it was yeah, it was funny. It was. I mean, it, it wasn't that scary, but it was. It was funny that I was like, I made it through this, and you know, now I'm going to die on the other side. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he took me back. They lived out in the middle of nowhere, um, and. Um, uh, in a farmhouse he had uh actually we got there in the morning and the and the and the uh, light was just coming up and he he wanted to show me his his garden and everything and i was like oh, that's you know that's cool i was a little tired his <laughs> wife his wife started yelling at him like get him to bed you know <laughs> <laughs> so we went and looked at his uh fruit trees and and all kinds of stuff <laughs> And then, uh, so I, I slept for about eight and eight or nine hours and, um, uh, woke up and well, actually she, she made me have breakfast. They, they had bees, they had fresh honey and she made me this homemade bread and, and, uh, something else. I don't know. It was kind of like an oatmeal and, um, uh, buckwheat cereal. I think it was something like that. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, uh, I woke up and I called my wife and she had, found some uh some tickets um for me airline tickets um you know i i'm we're down in in like uh uh north or we're up in northern romania and it there's like um you know there's not no big towns there right sure and uh really the only biggest town in in romania is is bucharest right mm -hmm. and um so uh, she found me, she talked to the guy in California that, you know, helped me with his brother-in-law and everything. And he said, there's flights out of this town called Succevia. So she went there and found, um, found some, found some flights out of Succevia. Um, and, uh, so I woke up, uh, the lady made me some homemade soup and everything for dinner and, and, uh, what have you. We, we talked for a little bit and I was using that, uh, Google, google app yep. uh, uh translator app because yep. you know he he spoke some english i i believe he worked in the uk before and so he spoke a little bit of english but he was high energy guy and uh he'd get rambling telling stories and then it was all broken and i couldn't understand what the heck he was saying so yeah. so we put it down on the google translate app and and uh we started laughing and we're having a good time and and um so he drove me, uh, that was, you know, seven o'clock at night. So, uh, we went back to bed and we woke up at like three in the morning and he drove me to the airport in Succevia, which was about, uh, 45, 50 minutes away. And I hopped on, there was a little one gate airport, hopped on a plane from Succevia to, um, Bucharest. And then I hopped on a plane in Bucharest to uh klug which is uh up in transylvania so i did a like a, a v in um in romania and then uh from klug i flew to austria and uh i spent the night in austria did you get a hotel and, or did uh, you spend the night in the airport no my wife got me a hotel okay and um uh i didn't get much i mean by the time i got in and grabbed a bite to eat and got to bed and I, you know, my life, I think my flight left at six 30 in the morning or something. So okay. I didn't, you know, I All probably right. got a good six, six hours, but it was better than nothing. So, totally. um, <clears throat> and, uh, so I went back to the airport, um, in Austria and I got on a plane to Paris and landed in Paris and my, my, uh, only had like an hour and 15 minute layover and, they, they put the wrong, they changed the gates, didn't text you or anything. So I went to the wrong gate, missed my flight. So I waited four more hours and met these other American people there that um, they were actually out 
of they were missionaries in Congo. Okay. And they were flying out of Congo back home to their son's house. And um, so I talked to them and, and uh, what have you, and then caught the next flight, uh, which was probably good. I think the one flight was kind of full. This one was maybe a third full. I had my whole row to myself, and um, it was great. So I flew from Paris to Atlanta and then uh, Atlanta to uh, San Antonio and wow. got home and... Yeah. How long was the actual journey like from the beginning? It was February 24th was the beginning. That's when you're on the way to the airport before you actually got home. Was it like a, almost a week? Yeah, it was. So So that was a Thursday and I got home on, I got home Tuesday at like 11 o'clock at night. Okay. So not quite a week. That's not bad. So not quite a week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Wow. 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 But... <clears throat> Yeah, when we were rolling out of town, though, I, uh, you know, in the bus, uh, you could see that, um, you know, you could see that, uh, uh, I mean, we probably counted at least 40, 50 tanks rolling in and, uh, oh, hundreds of troop carriers. Um, Russians or Ukrainian? Ukrainians, okay. all Ukrainians. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they had the city pretty much. They were they were going around the city, uh, you know, closing all the roads off with with uh, cement barricades and what have you, and making checkpoints and and what have you. And it, you know, it's it's really hard to um, it's really hard to tell what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I I don't I definitely don't watch the you know mass media news because. I mean, right from the get go, they're they're saying they're bombing Kiev, and and you know I'm walking around town, and so I try to I try to either watch some podcast or I try to uh, uh, like the Epic Times is a good source, mm -hmm. um, and uh, some some independent news. I still really don't know, you know, I don't have any contacts there really uh, in in the you know, the few contacts that I do have, like Max and few, you know, they're out of town. They're not in Kiev anymore. So they really don't know. You know, I mean, you look at World War Two, that was a genocide. Sure, of course. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. Well, but, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's just getting started. I mean, World War One and World War Two are slow moving before they became world wars. And since Putin can't really, um, he's sort of like wimping out on trying to address the Ukrainian military directly. He's just indiscriminately bombing schools and hospitals and apartment buildings, as you know, I'm sure. But um, yeah, I'm in direct yeah, contact. I see him. What? Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I've been in direct contact with most of the people there, um, including Max, um, my sort of usual driver. I talk to him uh, at least once every couple of days. But uh, no, it's, it's pretty horrendous on the ground there. I mean... Like something as simple as like I kept checking in and like, is the clinic still standing? Is the clinic still standing? They're like, yeah, it's still standing. Um, but, you know, we need liquid nitrogen to keep the cell bank uh, operational and, um, you know, cars and vans. Supply chains cut off. Well, it's supply chains being blown up on the way. So, right. But um, yeah, no, but they managed to pull it off somehow. There was a lull right when when it was like a. A week and a half ago, when Russia kind of slowed down because of just the Ukrainian might of fighting them back, um, some supply chains were opening up again. But when it was around the time when Russia changed its tactic and just started going after any and all civilians. I mean, because I'm on some of the chat rooms um, with some of the locals there um, where they just you can just like tap into a chat room. And I can't really read much of it unless I copy and paste it into Google Translate. But you get to see, you know, from people's handheld phones and, you know, closed circuit television that was uploaded and things like that. I mean, it's an absolute slaughter uh, against the Ukrainian citizens right now. And like some of the staff of MCEL, their apartment buildings are completely gone. Um, you know, they're, you know, some of them are in the western part of Ukraine. Max is still in the southern part of both south of Kiev with his family, you know, holding an AK-47. Um, you know, cause he can't leave, you know, otherwise anyway, some of the people have escaped to Europe, but there's about 30 people at the clinic, uh, with four AK 47s there. Um, they need bulletproof vests, um, and trying to help them try to find those. If I can pull that off. I mean, it's not an easy task. I mean, they don't, they're not like that easy to come by. I got people looking in Poland to try to see if we can get them at least a couple of them. It's not going to help you against a bomb, but, uh, you know, at least they have something to protect themselves if Russians start coming onto the property. 
you know, because it's sort of like they're going to hold that place down, you know, to the death, unfortunately, if they can pull it off. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, going back to genocide, I mean, yeah, it depends on what you define that as, but it's just, it's indiscriminate. I mean, just this morning, a hypersonic missile was launched by Russia, r- allegedly, not a nuclear one, but they're upping their ante on the civilian population pretty, pretty right. heavily. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, it's it's seriously a serious casualty of a war. I, it, it just it it could be so prevented. It, it could have been prevented if, um, I don't know, if if this whole NATO, UN, um, or EU uh, thing would have been it, this agenda just jammed down the throats. I mean, you, you sent me that podcast uh, or that lecture of that. Uh, foreign policy uh, professor from University of Chicago. Yeah, and um, I was listening to him, and and, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, whatever administration, uh, you know, we 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 didn't push it. No previous administration pushed this in the last eight years um, like this administration has, and and it's and basically, you know. It's almost like the U.S. and the Western countries are are pumping the chest up the Ukrainians and 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 filling them with it, almost false hopes, right? I mean, of becoming uh, a member of of NATO and and the EU and what have you, and and it's uh, because you know the German Chancellor doesn't even want him in there, you know, and um, I, I just feel really sad for the people because of politics and, and well, unfortunately Ukraine has been used as sort of, um, a buffer for upon. years. Yeah. Upon from, by both sides in a way, but more really it's more NATO and the West's fault about what's happened. Um, again, it's, it's hard to be, not be misunderstood on this one, but if they just allowed Ukraine into NATO ages ago, we wouldn't be here right now. Or if we were the entire NATO Alliance would be fighting Russia, uh, and not allowing this to happen. But yeah, I mean, I even have one of the lead scientists on camera because, as you know, I was in the middle of working on a documentary about M cell, a sequel to the God cells that sort of focused exclusively on what they're doing. And she was saying, you know, because I, I asked, I said, well, you know, is there a fear that fetal stem cells would be would go away if either the EU took over or if Russia took over? And they go, well, no, no, the EU would be fine, just like the Netherlands, you know how prostitution and marijuana and all kinds of things are legal in the Netherlands, even though it's under the EU uh, jurisdiction, you know, we would be fine. But if Russia takes over, then we're gone, you know, if, if because it's not legal under Russia jurisdiction. Um, and so, and of course she started carrying on into saying that, you know, um, that will probably never be a part of the EU. And she was explaining what I just said that, you know, they've been using us as a landmass buffer uh, between the Russian borders and the NATO borders. And so, and, you know, we should have been a part of the EU and NATO a long time ago, but they just like that buffer zone. So now everything's backfiring. Um, you know, we've allowed, you know, you know, Putin kind of nudged a little bit, see what, how we react when he annexed Crimea, um, you know, and uh, he's like, well, they didn't do anything. So let me just try to take over the whole damn country. And yeah. And it's also interesting um, I'm doing a lot of research on this. It's funny that University of Chicago guy, I think is, while well, I sent it to you and I, you know, I think he's right. And what we were saying, you know, he's right, but it, that was kind of pre pre Russia invasion. <laughs> like, like, I don't think even he believed Putin would have the courage to do this. Cause he, he himself said, if Russia, if Putin wants to destroy himself, all he has to do is invade Ukraine. And there he, now he's done it, you know, and we're watching the repercussions that's going on in Russia. I mean, people, um, you know, they just set that country back 30 years. I mean, if this continues, the economy is going to collapse. People are going to starve. It's going to be, it's going to well, be martial what, law. Yep. What's that? Yeah. That's, that's one thing he said though, is does he really want to occupy it? No, because it doesn't really have a strategic, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not strategic. Wow. Strategic to him, but, uh, he'll destroy it before he allows the West to have it. Right. So, right. um, that, and I think that's, I they kind of think that's what he's doing. Uh, I do wonder, you know, if, if Putin has the military capability, I mean, I, I think it could have been a, a, 
I, I'm surprised it's drug out this far. I'm surprised he doesn't have Kiev. I'm surprised, you know, I, I thought that he would have the military capability to, to take it quickly and what have you. But I, you know, I kind of wonder that, uh, if he, if that was his intention or his intention was just to wreck it. So to set him 30 years behind, you well, know what I mean? It depends on who you talk to. And, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of sort of dubious speculation based on, you know, just his previous actions. But, um, I mean, there's a lot of people that believe, and I, I kind of tend to lean into that camp now that he is going to try to take back the former Soviet Union. And so, like, if he is successful in Ukraine, Ukraine's just going to be a humongous military base. And he's going to hide behind the civilians while launching beyond that, Lithuania, heaven forbid, maybe Poland. But, I mean, I think I think if he's continuing, he's going to eventually cross into NATO. It's, I just think it's inevitable. Um, and, now I, and I think another side of it, too, is going back to what we were saying is, um, I think a lot of people are underestimating him. You know, everything he's threatened to do, he's done. And I think nuclear weapons is very much on the table. I don't know if it means he's just going to start nuking NATO in America or if he'll just pretend to pull out of Ukraine as a surrender and just nuke the place. I know, I know how I sound here, but like I think, you know, if you literally look at Putin's behavior, we really can't underestimate him. I mean, no one thought he would go for a third term. He did. No one thought he would try to assassinate his enemies outside of Russian soil. He's done that. Um, you know, no one thought he would annex Crimea. He did that. No one thought he would invade Ukraine. He's done that, <laughs> you know, and he's already threatened yeah. nuclear weapons. So, um, so what do you have to ask yourself? Like, like pragmatically, like, okay, is he the type to surrender? Absolutely not. I mean, he's not going to just roll over in a surrender. Um, I think he's just going to continue to escalate. Um, I think we should all be, you know, prepared for that. Um, I, you know, this is crazy. I, I don't mind saying it openly, but I literally have purchased potassium iodide. I have purchased hazmat suits, a Geiger counter, and emergency radio. Never thought I'd ever do that. <laughs> because if I survive, right. yeah, no, seriously. But if I survive the original blast, I don't want to die a slow death. I want to at least have a fighting chance. Because um, I think that it's a very real potential. Um, unless, of course, the only alternative is just if he's assassinated, it needs to be taken down. And of course, you have the Russian population, you know, it's kind of their responsibility to do it. But Putin is, because um, he's ex-KGB, and he was, um, I can't remember the terminology, but his job was to find spies within the network. So he's, he's, he's by instinct, he doesn't trust anybody and always thinks everybody is out to get him. So that's why you see people so far away from him at the tables and all of his meetings, like in all those big meetings with the people on the other side of the room. He's literally afraid of being taken out. I mean, he knows that the only way to stop this is to kill him. He's very aware of that, you know? So... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, <laughs> it's very, very frightening. It's a, you know, the, the, me being so invested in the country and so invested in following this therapy, knowing full well, cause I get emails like, well, you know, have they figured out a game plan to get out of there or set up shop elsewhere? I'm like, no, 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 there, there is no game plan. There is no elsewhere. This is it. You know, if, yeah, if there's no other, there's no other place to, that would allow that. I, I think the only other place is like, uh, Panama. Correct, no, no. Panama does umbilical, but it's not legal. Fetal stem cells are not legal. You could set up, there. you could set up illegally in Panama. You'll eventually get kicked out. The only thing you could do is set up illegally in Tijuana. Um, but you know, I mean, cause that's, it's, you know, there's so many things set up illegally in Tijuana that have been there for, you know, 10 plus years, but that's a huge operation. You got to get the cells out of Ukraine without of course being blown up in the process in this environment and then get them into Mexico and get them through customs somehow like that's I don't even know what that would entail not to mention getting some kind of facility that can be protected you know what I mean it's crazy it's absolutely nuts yeah, you just have to you just have to pay the cartel for all that no that's pretty much how it works honestly <laughs> no seriously I do I don't know their inner workings but I know um, a handful of people that have operations there. I don't keep in close contact with them as much as I used to, but it, it is doable. I've been there and seen these operations. Of course, there was the now fraudulent operation of Stem Cell of America, you know, that after they stole the cells from MCell, you know, before they ran out, you know, they were set up there, but they just rented something out once a month. But I do know one organization that um, has its own building, you know, with a big, like, you know, concrete wall around it. And it's been there, gosh, for 20 years. Um, and do a cancer therapy there. Anyway, I'm going to get off track there. But yeah, um, going back to like, why this is happening in Ukraine and all of that, um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of at fault here. But uh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and I agree. Like, I'm, I, I actually, because I know the Ukrainians and I know 
their fighting spirit. And I know that they would never, they would rather commit suicide or die fighting than go back under Russian rule. Like I actually, it's funny. Um, I was at a, my dental appointment and I, the hygienist actually asked me, do you think the Ukrainians are better off not being under Russian rule? And I kind of had to do a double take at her. Like, and it just goes to realize like how little people understand this country, um, you know, that, that never really, you know, they, some people still think it's Russia, you know, back here in the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, Ukraine was really, well, sorry, yeah? No, no, go ahead. Ukraine was really well on its way before this happened. Um, Putin did have a lot to be afraid of in the sense that this was becoming a westernized, growing democracy. I mean, it's really incredible how much they've grown. And, um, you know, when, when the 2014 Maidan, 13 and 14 Maidan protests occurred, I did a deeper dive on that after this happened. You know, they had a pro-Russian president. He was essentially a Putin puppet. And um, he was partly elected by lying and saying he would kind of set in motion being a part of the EU. And of course, after being elected and time went on, he reneged on that. And, you know, a couple of kids went down to the Maidan and started protesting. They got beaten up. The, uh, the citizens said, what are you doing to our people? And so it just grew and grew and grew into what it was before Putin finally said, look, if you're not going to stop this, I'll do it for you. And sent in snipers and started you know shooting people from the rooftops. And so the point is, though, Putin firmly believes that that was an American CIA sort of coup attempt. You know, he doesn't believe it was organic. Any sort of protest that uh, Putin always assumes it's American CIA, like it's always. <laughs> so any, that's why he's clamping down and because and, 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 he actually said, that's the point, you know, I'm next. Like he saw what happened in Ukraine and said, holy shit, I'm next. And so, yeah. that, so that's another reason why he decided to, he, first of all, while during the chaos, he annexed Crimea, but he had been planning, like it's one journalist said, it's like, you know, during COVID, people were buying too much stuff on Amazon and baking cookies. You know, Putin was planning on invading Ukraine, you know. <laughs> so. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, there's a great journalist. Well, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I, I mean, you look at Putin, Putin and he, you know, he, he's probably not too far off with the CIA. I mean, uh <laughs> Sure. No, no. I mean, look at how many look at how many countries they tried to topple with their with oh. their governments. <laughs> oh, no, there's no question. I mean, look, Libya, look the, Afghanistan. There's no question. The CIA has had a, like look at Venezuela. That was so obvious. That was one of the first blatantly open open ones where the CIA was involved in an attempted coup. No, no, I'm not denying that. I mean, good grief. Um, you know, and speaking of which, you know, let's just go there. Um, you know, it's a funny, amazing to see American government start talking about false flags. When false flags on all sides have been the first go-to thing to do to start a war. I mean, you know, all of them, you know, from the Lusitania to the Gulf of Tonkin. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not, right, I'm right. not naive to this, you know, but it, it is interesting to finally see, you know, America going, whoa, whoa, you know, you can't use those bag of tricks to start a war. That, that's our job. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though, even though, you know, that's what Putin has done, you know, the Chechnyan war and a lot of things, he's blown up his own buildings to start wars. I mean, you know, so, and, but it's kind of nice to see all of this kind of in the open. I don't want us to use the word nice. That's the wrong uh, terminology, but the fact that some of these, what would once be considered a conspiracy theory is all out in the open. I mean, it's incredible how the evolution of everything has happened um, because of this invasion. But, um, and false. You're, you're, what? you're, you're hundred percent correct. When you, when you said that Ukraine was, uh, I mean, it was turning, turning westernized, rapidly uh I, like i said i've never been there before mm -hmm. but but the the time that i did spend there and the 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 way that people acted and um uh they were excited uh they were excited for for capitalism and they were excited excited for for uh you know freedoms and and that town is bustling oh. and there's a tower there's a tower crane every other building yeah. i mean they were just it was it was unbelievable. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, Kiev. I've had some of the most fun times in the world. Um, I've been a lot of countries and a lot of big cities, and uh, for some reason Kiev just maybe it's just because of also my connection to this therapy and working so much as a journalist. But but I genuinely never get tired of being there. Um, not that I can really afford it, or definitely not going to really think about it now. But I always thought like if I had some extra capital, you know, why not just like invest in real estate there? You know. Um, but, uh, because it's so growing, you know, or it was, it, it's, yeah. such, it's such an incredibly growing, uh, you know, sort of country, but, um, yeah. 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 And you know, what's funny about the whole, the whole, uh, taking territory back, you look at China with Hong Kong and 
Taiwan and uh, what are those islands out there? Whatever those islands are. Um, but the, and then you look with you look at Putin and Russia with with the Ukraine and potentially other bordering countries. Uh, but really, in today's in, in, you know, I mean, if a superpower goes to war, really in today's uh, uh, yeah, today's you know w- wartime. Mm-hmm. It's not conventional war anymore. It's not like you know, fifty years ago. Even 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 like Afghanistan. It's it's all about how do you stop? Well, how does one superpower stop another superpower? The only way is a, is a nuclear threat, and that's what's so so scary about it. You know, you know, we're not going to send troops there because it it just doesn't matter, right? It, I mean, yeah, you're not gonna you're you're not gonna fight conventionally. It's it's going to be you know, um, uh, either with world ending weapons or, or, or with, you know, the, the sanctions are absolutely hilarious. You know, I mean, uh, it, let's tell, uh, a Burger King and McDonald's to stop doing business in Russia, you know, like, like, like that's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna, uh, uh, solve anything. And, and, and really these, these corporations are, you know, they're not going to stop, uh, uh, business in these countries um you know they're just going to do it do it behind people's backs and uh they're all about profit they they owe their shareholders and uh that's what they're going to do you know yeah like nestle refuses to leave i think i see people boycotting nestle right now but yeah um i mean the sanctions have definitely hit economically but it would it'd be okay if putin cared like he doesn't care about his own population whatsoever it doesn't really matter you know, it's all about, um, you know, him and his inner circle. But yeah, I mean, I haven't been paying attention to the sanctions. They are um, hitting the country extremely hard, but it's not going to prevent any escalation. I mean, that's for certain. No. And going back to what you're saying, like if I was, not that I've ever been in the military, but if I was a sort of uh, high up in the American military, I'd probably be uh, doing war games and how do we flatten the entire continent and pretend like we didn't do it, you know, <clears throat> and like, and not get a right. retaliatory strike because hypersonic, um, missiles are impossible to shoot down. They're nearly impossible. Um, I don't know if you've researched this at all, but then he just, these, these things like normal ballistic nukes, you can knock out of the sky, but hypersonics in turn and weave and dodge and they, they can fly below radar. I mean, you know, <laughs> Does you ever, and also you ever heard of the Russian, um, Poseidon, you ever heard of this thing? <laughs> Yeah, 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 I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I listened to a guy named Mike Baker. He was in the CIA, and and um, you know, uh, he has pretty good intelligence. I'm I'm sure still, um, but uh, you know, he he, <laughs> I I don't know if he couldn't say it on his podcast or if uh, if it's true what he said. Um, no one really knows who has hypersonic weapons. Uh, you know, there's really three countries that would have hypersonic weapons and, and no one knows which one actually has them and, or, or which one, um, you know, as bluffing or what have you. But if, uh, if that was confirmed, you know, Russia had a hypersonic, hypersonic missile, then wow. Well, I mean, again, I don't have any proof of this because, I mean, you know, it's hard to know what to believe, but just doing research and looking at videos and, you know, you know about, you know, who has what. Allegedly, they do have hypersonics. Uh, America uh, and Russia for sure have hypersonics, allegedly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Crazy stuff. Yeah, it is. But you know what's even more frightening, I think, is are these Poseidons. Like, you know, there's they have like 35 of these allegedly, and they can just launch them from a sub, sit them on the bottom of the ocean, like 100 miles off, say, Los Angeles or New York, and just turn them on when they feel like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And even if, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Well, you, you know, they, the, the first week of the Olympics, while well, everyone was uh, worried about, uh, you know, protesting and COVID and everything like that, you know, the Russians cut a uh, huge energy deal with the Chinese government. Mm-hmm. And and they uh, and that's why I find that a lot of these sanctions and using I'm like, dude, who's the producer of of everything in the world, more or less the Chinese? I'm totally. OK, yeah. 
and and if if, if Russia is supplying them natural gas, petroleum, uh, everything else, they built that pipeline down through Kazakhstan right into China. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, that, that is, it, they've got the number one economy, really, ultimately. They say the U.S. economy is number one, but we're just purchasers. Uh, you know, that's all we do is purchase with, with, with our money. We don't really... You know, I mean, sure, we build some stuff, but not compared to the Chinese. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, that's sort of like the next uh, phase of this, going back to what I was saying, like how every world war starts slow. It does, it's not like an on and off switch. Um, as soon as it, there's rumors that China is, um, you know, helping Russia, it's all rumors at the moment. But I think once that materializes, because I think inevitably it'll eventually come out that China is, you know, going to have Russia's back on what they're doing. And then America will start sanctioning China, you know, <laughs> and because, you know, and then and I don't know how much they could do that um, because like even Taiwan, which China wants to also take over. I mean, so much of our computer chips come out of there. So supply chain problems will be like on a be sent into overdrive, um, you know, because, uh, because of all the reliance on the Taiwan computer chips. Um, not to mention all the stuff that we rely on coming out of China uh, in general outside of Taiwan. It'd be very challenging. It's easy to sanction Russia and cut them off um, because I think America was only taking 10 or 15% of its oil and or natural gas from Russia. So that's easy. Unlike Germany, which yeah. is like 75% dependent. But, uh, but that's how this thing gets ramped up um, is, you know, as if, you know, Again, it goes back to the only way to stop this is if Putin is on a slab. <laughs> it just really sucks. Yeah, right? yeah. You're, you're right. I mean, you're, you're right in that sense. I mean, um, but, you know, you look, at, you look at the world. It's, it's Team Western or, you know, Team North America or Team Communism. Yeah. So, and I think that's what this whole thing is, is about. I mean, you, you look at they're trying to maintain their ground, right, with their – communist countries and their beliefs and we're trying to in their view radicalize the world make it a western civilization you know i mean sure and then of course the irony is if you really look at what communism is i mean like the old karl marx days like nothing of true communism is in russia or china i mean if anything i've argued that that is, they are the ultimate capitalists. <laughs> America would love to be that capitalist where they can control. Well, they, they would love to be able to control everything else. That's, yeah, right? yeah. And, you know, because, you know, Russia and China is basically, they're both capitalists. I mean, it, it might have the communism sort of like stamp on them, but uh, it's it's not. Uh, I don't know what you would call it. Um, you could you can come up with a different, bunch of different vocabulary words for it. But, uh, but yeah, no, you're right. I mean, is, there is an East versus West sort of struggle going on that, you know, yeah, I completely agree with you. And there is, it is I, true. I, mean, I, th- yeah. hmm? I think that's why they suppress their people so they don't get, you know, I mean, capitalism drives everything. And that's so funny about some of these um, <laughs> college students and what have you. And they want socialism and stuff. You're like, buddy, socialism doesn't work. Okay. It, it, even these communist countries are capitalist, just like you said. Yeah. I mean, but they just, they just suppress their people so they don't have the the views and the ideas of you know free people in the west or sure. so-called free people in the west you know i mean it's it's um they even know that that communism doesn't work because people starve there's no food there's no there's nothing you know i it, it's it's uh it just doesn't work anymore yeah, yeah, because yeah, unfortunately, you're always gonna have um, the people in charge, you know, wanting more and more and more for themselves. Unfortunately, that's just historically, it's always been that way. Um, so, I mean, you kind of have to start from scratch, and almost like the television show Severance, um, where they wipe your brain. <laughs> you know, there's just no way. I mean, you can't reprogram uh, this kind of conditioning overnight. And socialism too. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I know there's a lot of very young, naive people screaming socialism, but honestly, I, I would argue in many respects, it's kind of already here. I mean, in 2008, if this was a genuinely capitalist society, we would have never bailed out those banks. Um, you know, during COVID, if it was genuinely capitalism, we would have never, again, I, I very much support and I happily took my PPP loans that were forgiven in my unemployment during COVID. 
But I mean, and we are, you know, everything's going towards socialism anyway. It just, you know, they just don't understand <laughs> what it looks like, you know, because as tech, you have, we have this interesting problem where we have technological deflation fighting with monetary inflation. So what I mean by that is, you know, by in the next five or 10 years, everything's going to be fully automated. Um, and I know we already know this, but but it's really happening and it's happening at an exponential rate. And the, like, you know, uh, the, you know, you walk into like a McDonald's in Paris and there's really hardly any employees. It's just all kiosks everywhere and it's all fully automated. I mean, and we're talking about by 2030, most automobiles, it'd be silly to own one at all because they're just going to be driving around all the time. And if you did own one, you're just going to be making money off the one you own as it drives while you're sleeping. You know what I mean? And because more right. and more corporations do not need human beings that have to call in sick and like complain or get, you know, get COVID and you don't have to worry about, oh, are they vaccinated or not? And blah, blah. When you can just automate the whole damn thing. I mean, even in medicine, um, there was a great study um, where uh, it was like nearly 80% of the time, uh, like lung scans for lung cancer, that the computer was able to pick up lung cancer 80% of the time more accurate than a human eyeball. So there you go. You don't even need radiologists anymore, you know? So it's just the exponential rate of no more needed human staff. I mean, not everybody, clearly. So that what I'm getting at is you're going to have no choice but to have universal basic income, you know, across the board. You know, that's why they're doing the central bank digital currency. There's buzzes about that. So you just knock out the bank and they send it right to your phone wallet. And also you'll have negative interest rates as well, where if you don't spend it, it'll just go away. So socialism is well on its way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I see that. I see that as capitalism fighting socialism um, in, in a sense that we're finding alternative methods to get rid of people that, uh, I don't know, Ex expungent wages and what have you. I, I just, um, but I agree with you in that. And the whole thing that's scary is the digital wallet. Um, now they can tell you. Uh, I mean, they can do anything with that. They're, they're yep. that's. It's not even a currency. They're going to call it a currency, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's actually a voucher, okay? Mm -hmm. So. When they when they put that money in your digital wallet, maybe they'll tell you you can only eat McDonald's once a week because it's bad for your health. Beef is bad for you. Sure. Or they, they can tell you you can only uh, you know you're allowed a six pack of beer a week. So, <laughs> I mean, I wish these people would like open their eyes and and uh, and, and see. I mean, maybe maybe they want to live like that. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, as far as the you know, as far as the currency goes, you know, there is an alternative. I mean, and that is what started all of this. And of course, there's a whole longer conversation. And that is Bitcoin because it is permissionless. It is volatile as hell. But um, you you could. That's sort of like why that thing is going to go skyrocketing into the multiple six figures, perhaps seven figures within a decade. Once the central bank digital currency comes in, no one's going to want to put the majority of their wealth in that, and they're going to move it into something else that you know that you can self custody that can't be turned on and off. That's something else I I don't really talk about much, but I've probably know as much about that as I do fetal stem cell therapy, and um, and yeah, I personally made those choices um, and happy that I did. But yeah, 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 me too. we're getting down multiple. <laughs> oh, you too, you too. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Just in the, just in the last year. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. 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 I, I don't want to get in a huge rabbit hole on that one. Plus also you, you got to no. be careful because you can make yourself a target. I've even had my phone hacked SIM card swap scam for being too vocal about it. Um, cause I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of out there, you know, and, uh, all you, somebody has to do is email me and pretend to be a, somebody interested in getting the therapy and then they have your phone number, you know? Yeah, because <laughs> I'm such a nice guy trying to help people like I did with you, you know. So yeah, yeah. But overall, I mean, I tell you what, I I had such a good experience in in the Ukraine, and um, I mean the people, I, I, you know, I cross my fingers and and pray every night that that stuff changes there, and 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 that that clinic is allowed to go back to doing their work and uh because those people were absolutely just amazing i mean you want to talk about hospitality you want to talk about 
being thorough and being knowledgeable and just overall in general caring. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was, it was, it was amazing. I'll I'll take medical treatment over there than here all day long. (laughs) Yeah. You know, you can see why I've Um, been so obsessed with this and, you know, um, like, yeah, I mean, um, my, my problems don't, are you know, pale in comparison to the people in Ukraine right now. But like, yeah, I haven't seen a regular doctor since 2016 because I would go there f- several times a year filming and following up and things like that or just getting my annual therapy or going there accompanying a family member or my wife's family member and just another excuse to go. Plus my wife's family being in Poland, you know, it was always just, I was always kind of like brought to that part of the world a lot anyway. But the point is, my medical care was far beyond anything I'd ever experienced in the United States and uh, far more comprehensive. They were able to pick up on things that might be, you know, cause for concern, things like that, that no American doctor would have ever noticed, you know? So yeah, no, the professionalism and everything is just absolutely stellar. And I, yeah, I too hope that they survive this somehow. I mean, COVID almost destroyed them and this is now a nationwide invasion. So it's it's tough. I mean, but at least the build as long as the building still stands, stem cell bank is still you know operational. I still hold out some hope, um, you know, that this thing can survive. But like, I have a really hard. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, because you know, it's, imagine this for a minute. Like again, I don't mean to say that my problems come close to you know the people there, but you know, imagine um, I'd been filming for over two years, traveling around the world and the United States, following you know obviously going to Ukraine first, filming people, getting the therapy, you know, a lot of them before therapy. And then of course, following up with them after similar to like how you and I met, but just imagine I was at the clinic. I said, Hey, I'm meet you at the clinic, Paul, I'm going to film you before. And I'm going to follow up and see you in Texas later. You know, that was doing that. Um, and I finished everything. I had maybe one more trip to go, but I didn't really need to because I had so much follow up stuff with this guy. Anyway, this one guy with Parkinson's, but the point is I was in the middle of editing this film so happy and excited about it, about 40 minutes into like a 90 minute running time target. And then fucking bombs are falling on into Ukraine. And I'm like, I could not, I still can't bring myself to go back to it. Um, but you know what I mean? It's so hard to go back to it. Um, but I'm gonna still try it. I think I will still finish this film, even if there's no Ukraine left. I think it's important that the world knows what happened there, at least with this, within this therapy. <laughs> that once was, and, you know, maybe we'll be resurrected somehow, but, uh, it's just, yeah, the, the level of just absolute shock and horror that this is, uh, I've gone through, through this is just hard to describe. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. I, I tell you what, I, I have to tell you this before we, before we, uh, end this, but yeah, <laughs> I, I love, uh, I love humor. I love, I, I think it drives people. I think, uh, there's a lack of it in the world. And, uh, I, I just love everything about joking around and what have you. And I had, uh, my doctor, a uh, doctor, was it Lara? Lara? Uh, anyways, her sister works there. She's a doctor too. Right. Mm-hmm. And she does, uh, she works in a, or she, she might not be a doctor, but she's a scientist, whatever, PhD, whatever. I don't know. She works in the lab part. And uh, she brings the cells out to you. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was just joking around with Dr. Lara and we were having a good time and uh, what have you. And I have quite a few previous injuries from uh, like motorcycle accidents and, and what have you. And, and you know, they do examination and, and she's pointing to all these different scars and uh what happened here? What happened there? And I'm telling her and she goes, you know, she's telling me that I'm crazy and all this <laughs> stuff. And, 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 uh, so her sister comes in to, uh, on the first day to inject, uh, the, the stem cells into the intravenous IV, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, she starts putting them in near that red jelly. And then you can see through the IV a fluid solution that, you know, it's pink and it starts going down the line and I'm watching it go down the line. As soon as it got to my arm, I looked over at her and I just started shaking like I was having a convulsion. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And the look on her face was like, Oh my God, what's happening to this guy? (laughs) 
<laughs> and then I looked up at her and smiled, and she just started laughing. She must have laughed for five minutes. There's like tears coming out of her eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's so cool because because oh, yeah, so many patients are just so serious. That's that's hilarious, Paul. That's hilarious. I'm sure you made her day. Oh yeah. You know those people were so, they were so nice to me. I I went and um, I want to say uh, well, it was Tuesday night. I went down to the underground mall. I was going to buy them all flowers, <laughs> but I'm like, how am I going to buy like five bundles of flowers and yeah. carry them in there? So I went down and bought them. Uh, I don't know these bath things. What if you know? I don't know, like uh, scrubs and what have you. Mm-hmm. And um, I brought them in and and. Uh, they were all so thankful that I had this trans, you know, um, translator, uh, young lady and I give her one and the, and the couple of doctors one and the nurse one. And then I give one to, uh, the, the there's a young girl that would bring me my breakfast yep. and if I wanted lunch and what have you. She's blonde, right? And that, yeah, a yep. young blonde girl. Yeah, yep. I know. Yep. 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 Yeah. Uh, actually they sent me her name. It was, um, uh, nah, I can't remember. Anyways, I got it in, in an email, but anyways, uh, I give her one and I, and she didn't speak English that well. And I said, you know, this is for you. I said, thank you, you know, for, for, you know, taking care of me and everything like that. And the girl started crying. Oh my God. I was like, Oh, I, and, and I, I felt bad at first. I'm like, did I, you know, do, you know, but I'm like, well, she probably doesn't get a whole lot of stuff like that. And, and even though it wasn't, it wasn't something big, but sure. it was, um, you know, and they're, the people are just so genuine over there and so nice. And like I said, I just, I hope everything worked out for them. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. So we never even asked about, I know it needs a good three months for it to kick in, but we never, I never really had you talk on, on this podcast or us, our conversation about how you're feeling. Cause you went there for extreme neuropathy may have been due to, uh, chemicals because of your uh, job as a pipe fitter, but you're not entirely sure. Um, like, so where are you at? Like kind of with that since the therapy? Well, I tell you what, when, when I left Ukraine, I was feeling pretty darn good. Like, mm-hmm. uh, my hands were feeling well and, and what have you. And then, you know, I had a little bit of a, I didn't have a relaxing ride home. Like most people would, I had to take a couple of detours. Mm-hmm. So I, sure. <laughs> I, I'm thinking, uh, maybe a little bit of stress, uh, uh, you know, my hands got a little sore when I got home and, but, uh, now it's kind of day on day off kind of thing. And I mean, put it this way, I'm, I, I'm feeling better than when I went. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it's only been what, uh, three weeks, yeah. something like that. Yeah. It hasn't even been a full month yet. So yeah, it hasn't even been a full month. The way it, of what I, well, what I really Dove did a deep dive in in the new movie. Um, I really did a deep dive on the science, um, and uh, much more than just having a bunch of patient testimonials. Even though I do have plenty of those in there with medical records and things like that. But the thing is, um, because they're fetal um, and they're you know they harvested the entire fetus basically at the end of the first trimester. And in your case, it's the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are the um, cells that build small capillaries and line the blood vessels. Um, and they also have an effect on uh, the nervous, uh, the, the nerve endings in the nervous system. That, in com- combination with the actual neuronal cells, because of uh, your neuropathy, that also you know help with the nervous system as well. The point is, though, because they don't cultivate them like all other stem cell therapies, where they just take it from your fat or your bone marrow um, and they just grow them in a lab. That's where they boast, oh, you know, we're going to give you 200 million cells. That's just a you know a sales pitch. This in this case, they. They give you just the right amount of cells, so after they're injected into you, they sort of explode and proliferate inside of you. So that's why it takes time. That's why it needs a few months. So even in a literal sense, like I was, um, I obtained some time lapse footage of uh, I will include in the movie of uh, like a single heart cell uh, beating in real time, growing into a colony. Uh, heart cells, by the way, are not muscle cells. There's some kind of chemical reaction in the cells that make allow them to beat in unison. It's a fascinating thing I learned. But even in the endothelial cells, a single endothelial cell, boom, colony. So, and it takes about up to sometimes, you know, one to three months, depending on the cell type, to fully proliferate. And so that's that's why they say it takes some time. So I'd like to see where you're at, you know, after a full month, two months, three months. 
Um, you can kind of bank on whatever you're at at the three month mark, kind of being what you know what this is going to do for you. Um, generally, sometimes it, it's longer for some people. But um, yeah, that's why it's sort of not like an overnight instantaneous situation. But the growth factors you were given, uh, in addition to the sales, that's what the immediate reaction is. Because um, the growth factors are given in addition to the sales um, to kind of mimic what it would be like in a lab, except inside of your body. So to allow these things to just really go into overdrive. Um, so that's why a lot of people, including myself, like within hours, sometimes within a day or two, you're seeing, you're feeling these incredible results. It's not necessarily the cells themselves. It's the growth factors given in addition to them. Um, so, and like you were, you were talking about the pink, uh, liquid being injected and they put it into the line. Those were your endothelial cells and your liver cells and other immune based cells. Um, the liver cells were, are the foundation of your entire bone marrow or your entire immune system and your blood system. So for, that's why I kept saying for neuropathy, I mean, if it's chemical related, you, it might be more challenging for the cells. It depends on the extent of potential damage if it is chemical. But people with simple neuropathy from, you know, the general neuropathy, um, you know, like say from diabetes type 2 or a whole host of things, it just completely knocks it out. I've never heard of anyone having neuropathy where this didn't completely knock it out. Uh, you know, again, depending on the reasons why the neuropathy is there. Uh, nerve damage gets a little more complicated, uh, but it doesn't mean it's not possible to knock it out. But, uh, and, um, and yeah, I, yeah. When, I, when I spoke with, the doc, with Dr. Laura or Lara, um, you know, she said, uh, uh, as long as the nerves are not dead, yeah, then they will regenerate. Yeah. But you, there's no way to tell if they're, you know, they're, they're typically dead and, 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 you know, I'm just hoping, you know, my feet were the first thing that really, uh, that, that, that I noticed when I, when I got these symptoms. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, they, I, you know, I, I don't, I can't feel them any better or I can't, you know, nothing like that, but, um, they sure do feel like they have more circulation for some reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that sounds funny when I say, more circulation, but I can feel like, uh, different temperatures going up and down my calves yeah. into my feet that I never felt before. Yeah. Those are the endothelial cells I gave you. So, and those are the, that's why they give them to you on the first day because they really want your circulatory system to get kick into overdrive because without a good circulatory system, the cells can't go to where they need to. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure that's happening. So it's just whether or not, you know, like you said, uh, if the nerves are affected or not, but your circulatory system is definitely, you know, better off now than, it, than it's probably been in years. Yeah. Overall. So, yeah. Yeah. But the experience was, you know, I mean, besides, you know, Thursday morning was fantastic. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, I just couldn't <laughs> believe it, Paul. Like I was like, you got, I was like, oh my God, like. I just never believed it. I just never believed this was going to happen. I honestly didn't. And I just couldn't believe it. I mean, you, you were, you've always been great. Like, you know, it's just like, you seem like just a really strong dude that isn't one to like freak out and panic as you've clearly demonstrated through our conversation. And even before this happened, but I just remember telling everybody, I was like, Oh my God, I, you know, I remember just convincing this guy from Texas to go. <laughs> just like, you know, what, what have I done? Like, Holy shit. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> Well, but, uh, you know, like, you know, if, you know, if, if it was because I was, uh, you know, low on testosterone or, or, or if it was because I didn't, you know, feel like I did when I was 20, maybe I wouldn't have went, but, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, I, I, I made the statement to you don't really have anything to lose. Right. You know what I mean, I, when you, when you I, said those uh, kinds of things, you know, considering how miserable this has been with the neuropathy. Yeah. That, I mean, I will give, uh, that, that, I mean, I will give myself some credit by encouraging you to go like now. It's like, if, because if it does happen, you don't want to wait. Well, it, yeah. yeah. If you didn't tell me to go now, then I may never have gotten the treatment. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there's another uh, patient from America that went to Berlin because he had family there, or friends there, and was just hanging out, just kind of waiting to see what happened. And he left before you. Um, he never got a chance to go, you know. Was, yeah. And it's really sad. Like, I'm getting a lot of emails from people asking me about 
the, the future of this people that rely on this therapy and I really don't know what to tell them and somebody at your door hey, Eric. yeah you gotta go yeah somebody at my door can you hold no just oh. give me one second yeah no problem okay yeah. one second <laughs> all right no problem sales call yeah solar panels <laughs> is that what I heard yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so yeah I, I'm 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 happy I got the treatment and I'm I'm you know it, it, like I said overall it was a good experience I didn't you know, it wasn't like, um, you know, I, I, w I was trapped in a city being bombed or anything. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really, it, it wasn't traumatic. It, it was just inconvenient, more or less, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it was, I tell you, like I said, I'm going to say it again. I sound like a broken record, but I just hope everything works out there because I, I do not want to see, you know, I, I don't want to see that place go away. Yeah. Yeah. Me either. There's literally no other option on planet earth for this. Uh, there just isn't, you know, there's, it would have to go through a regulatory process. The only reason if you didn't know that this is even legal in Ukraine was because of Chernobyl, Chernobyl hit massive disaster. They, they couldn't get bone marrow matches for bone marrow transplants with people with bone marrow failure due to radiation exposure. And so the, the inventors of this therapy, and as well as others, not just them, they started um, giving fetal liver cells to people with radiation poisoning and bone marrow failure. And I actually put this in the movie um, as well, and even have an LA Times article talking about it from 1986, as well as one of the co-founders talking about this as well, the first person that they treated, which was a child who's still alive today. And they treated the child with two rounds of fetal liver cells as a, as a replacement for a bone marrow transplant that couldn't be obtained. Um, not, not to mention, like a lot of the patients, their bone marrow was so screwed that they couldn't even get enough of a sample to get a proper match because they were flooding them with transfusions. Um, and so, you know what I mean? So like they couldn't, even if they had the, the match available, they couldn't match it to the patient because the bone marrow was so screwed. Anyway, so that's how it began. And because of this tragedy, they, it was allowed to be fast-tracked. But any other country, you're talking about giving 24 cell types to a human being that you've received, that I've received. You're talking about, um, you know, two decades of clinical trials for each cell type individually the way the system is designed much less combining them into 24 cell types all at once i mean it's it's literally impossible to do it ukraine's the only country on earth where this is legal and ready to go otherwise you'd have to set up shop illegally i don't know maybe rent a private jet and fly into international airspace and give it or rent a buy a huge yacht in international waters and give it i mean there's just no other way to do it outside of ukraine so um if ukraine falls yeah, yeah. Have, have you talked to i i know you have connections there of you know, obviously making documentaries and what have you, but have you talked to any of them? Do, do they have a, I mean, it's hard to get a game plan when you don't know what's going on, but do they, you know, are, are, are they going to try to keep this alive? Are they going to maybe move it or, 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 or well, do they have any ideas? Well, just to be clear, like they can't move it outside of Ukraine. Um, that's like, it's not possible. I mean, it's, they've even spent a lot of money on lawyers and lobbyists to look at any other country that would allow this. They kind of made headway in the Bahamas, um, but the Baham Bahamas government is also closely tied to the American uh, FDA as well, even though it's technically yep. a different country. They made the law, because they were so powerful with their case, showing the science and had enough uh, muscle behind them, they managed to get the Bahama government to make it legal there, but the law was so vague and draconian that if you did one this wrong or that wrong, it's like 10 years in jail, tens of millions in fines, but the law was so vague, it didn't really define what was illegal and how you shouldn't handle it. So it was their way of like coming to a truce, the Bahama government, by, you know, you know, surrendering to like, okay, yes, this is, this should be legal here based on all the information presented, but we will make it almost impossible for you to do it. You know what I mean? Like the American FDA right. is, has raided clinics in the Bahamas. The American FDA has gone into the Bahama soil and raided clinics there like for cancer therapies. So it would be very dangerous to answer your question. So as long as people first understand that you cannot do it outside of Ukraine. So once you know that, um, um, I mean, you can't do it in China, you can't do it anywhere. And secondly, 
Um, so he got, just to elaborate on that, like MSEL is literally the only people in Ukraine harvesting this. Like the other so-called competing clinics, they were buying it on the black market from India. The cells highly infected, if not dead on arrival cells. Um, and uh, they don't have the, the resources and the knowledge to harvest them. Only M cells people have had this. Like the, the the level of expertise it takes to properly harvest the cells from abortions, getting the abortions to the facility fast enough, first of all. Secondly, being able to test them for every bacteria and virus under the sun, and then be able to preserve their viability and what they call suspensions and suspend them in time if they are clean, you know, and not ruining them in the meantime. Um, and to sort them and separate that neuronal from the endothelial, from the heart. Like, this is a huge, expensive undertaking. I mean, the new clinic was at least a $10 million investment of their own money. No bank loans. So, there's a, as you can imagine, they, they invested so much into this uh, there, knowing that it's the only place on the earth they could do this. Never imagining in a million years that bombs and missiles will start falling out of the sky. So, to answer your question, yes, they are holding on to hope. I mean, all of these people, especially like the lead scientists, that's all they know is fetal stem cell therapy. Can you imagine being like this biotechnology sort of professional and having to go resort to doing some subpar technology just to make a living when you made a living off of doing literally the most incredible stem cell technology humanity has ever seen? Like, do you know what I mean? Yes, they're going to try to hold on to this. But they finished this building in late 2019. They've been working on it while having an older clinic that I put in the movie, uh, you know, running at the same time. It took them four and a half, some years to finish this building. And then two months later, COVID hit. And they realized it would be more expensive to shut it down than to keep it open. So they kept it open, braved through COVID. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you know, Putin invasion. So I don't know, as long as the clinic still stands and as long as the stem cells, um, you know, stock is preserved, of course, I think they're going to try to keep it going. But I will admit, like, I'm already racking my brain. Like, how do we like maybe get some of this to Tijuana? Like, how can I help them do that? But whenever, just so you know, like whenever I bring this stuff up and I try to remind them that I am very hopeful they kind of giggle uh, in their own way and just look at me as being this naive American going, you know, we are, excuse me, Eric, you know, we're busy trying to not die here. We're busy trying to protect our families here. Yes, we believe in the science and the clinic, but this is the last thing we can think about right now, you know? Like, and then that's when they informed me that, you know, we getting the liquid nitrogen without the vans being blown up is our latest struggle, you know? Like, you know, we can't, you know, yes, we want to get this place to survive, but please remember, you know, if you walk down the street, you're going to be shot, you know? <laughs> please remember if you're sleeping in your bed, you could be blown up, you know? It's like, that, that's our yeah. that's our worry right now. So, yeah, it's intense. It's intense. But yeah, I mean... So are, yeah. are, the, are the Russians actually in Kiev now? I mean, are uh, they... There's... Um, whatever, 10 to 15 kilometers, whatever that is in miles, is where they are from the clinic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're slowly surrounding Kiev, but, you know, because of thanks to American and NATO uh, military equipment, they are really doing a great job of pushing them back. But even if Russian troops make it in, I think that shouldn't be the worry. The worry is just leveling the entire city, uh, just leveling it, because that's what Russia yeah. tends to do. That's just sort of in their doctrine. To if we can't, because they, they know that there'll be a years long insurgency if they try to go in and try, you know, there's no way the Ukrainians aren't going to constantly be shooting them from their bedroom windows and throwing Molotov cocktails and blowing up every Russian that's on the street if they can get away with it. Even if they know they can't get away with it and that means risking their own lives. I mean, there's no taking over Kiev. Even if they take out Z Z Zelensky, the Russian people, excuse me, the Ukrainian people are not going to surrender. You know, there's just not. So the only way Putin right. can can really win this is, as we kind of said earlier, is to just turn the country into a fine ash, as one person put it. So if that happens, the clinic would, I'm sure, be included in that. And unfortunately, you remember where the clinic's located, and these are brand new residential district. You know, they was they put it there. You know, just for like you know, in their mind at the time, you know, a nice safe place to put it. Um, but of course, residential districts are Putin's favorite place to bomb right now. So, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to know, man. It's hard to know. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I mean, they're slowly there. Um, but worse than that, like if you're talking about troops on the ground, there's a lot of non, non-uniformed non Russian military in there trying to be pro provocateurs in Kiev. Like they're being arrested left and right. Um, they're being found out about and either killed on the spot or arrested. Um, so you kind have- Kind of like your own FBI? 
<laughs> right, sure. Yeah. So kind of like what they tried yeah. to do during, you know, yeah. Just, yeah, it's like both sides have been guilty of this. They send their own provocateurs in. But that's that's what um, Russia's, that's that's the extent of Russian military on the ground there. Which goes to show that they're they're failing miserably. They're starting to bring in old material. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm on these chat rooms, um, and uh, there's a couple of good sources. That, like the Kiev Independent is a really good piece of source of media. There, I've been following on Twitter and their website and on Telegram. But right when it started, I was there's something called Viber. You ever heard of this app? Similar to WhatsApp. Viber is a I popular. Have. Viber is a popular thing they use there um, in Ukraine. But uh, I was invited to this room where you get to see, you know, like if they, you know, arrest a Russian soldier, you, these are like 18 or 19 year old children that were not told they were going in to invade this country. They were told they were going into ex for exercises. Um, so yeah, yeah. I don't know. The good news is that Russian uh, soldiers don't have the heart for this. The Ukrainians do. It's just that Russia has a lot better artillery and more large amounts of it than the Ukrainians do. But as more time goes by, there gets more and more, you know, really the, like the javelins have saved Russia, the Ukraine's ass. I mean, these things are unbelievable. They go right through the wall of a tank and explode after they enter the inside. I mean, kaboom, just one hit. It's incredible. And they, I think there's some 450 tanks have been blown up at this stage. Um, it's outrageous um, how the casualty and the, the equipment that has been destroyed on behalf of uh, Ukrainians against Russia is phenomenal, uh, how, what they're doing. It's incredible. Yeah, especially since, you know, I mean, just the short time I was I was there, uh, the weaponry that they had and, and the, I don't know, I guess I would say organization and what have you was what you would think would be coming from a developing country, right? Oh, yeah. Well, ever since <laughs> it, Crimea, it, they were ready for this. They've been training for this since Crimea, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but... I, you know, I, I've seen these, uh, you know, like like National Guard is what I would call them, you know, the, the voluntary military that were patrolling the streets and what have you. And you know, when you're driving your own vehicles and you have no body armor and 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 you have only five five magazines uh, with the 1960s, even though they're good weapons, mm -hmm. OK, and 1960s weapons. uh you know, I mean, it's not like, I guess, living here in the U.S., you're a little bit spoiled, right? I yeah. mean, you, you notice, you notice how much funding goes to the military, and and uh, you know, it, you look at that, and you and you thinking, oh my goodness, do these people have a chance? Oh, but you know, with with the with, with the weapons from the U.S. and NATO and other countries, um, thank goodness, yeah. uh, you know. But but I was really uh i was really scared for him um just by seeing what i saw right i mean and 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 all most of the weaponry that they have the tanks and the and the troop carriers and everything like that it's it's all old russian stuff that was left from you know uh when you know when they when they weren't uh uh, uh when they were still part of the soviet union yeah you know Yep, yep. So it it was uh, it, it was a little bit crazy, but um, thank God they're holding their own, and uh, hopefully, you know they they don't they don't forget about them. They just keep giving them aid, and God, hopefully that city just is not destroyed. Yeah. But by the end of it, you know, I mean, yeah. that'd be that'd be such a shame. It would be. It would be. Yeah, I mean, I still hold out hope. Obviously, you have to in some degree, um, without being completely naive to everything. But um, yeah, I mean, my focus. Um, personally is just, just, let's just, I mean, I can't help it. Like let the clinic be spared somehow. Let there be a way. Cause frankly, if the way I see this, just, um, you know, this I've done five, six documentaries. I can't even keep track at this point, but, but this would have been, I think it's been at least my sixth one. And honestly, I was just sort of before this happened, expecting, you know, you know, it'll get a small audience, especially nowadays. It's harder to get a large audience as a documentary filmmaker, independent documentary filmmaker, even if it's a really kick-ass film. Like even if it's something that everybody sees and goes, holy shit, you know, which I frankly will admit a lot of the stories I tell, I get a lot of those responses. But um, if they somehow survive this, I think it would, and the clinic survives this and people are allowed to go back again or at least safely without risking their lives, um, you know, to get this therapy. I mean, I think it would really, 
it's sort of like a lemon lemonade out of lemon situation where it could really shine a light on what they're doing beyond anything I think would have happened previously. That's, I'm trying to keep look at the brighter side if it's all even remotely possible that uh, you know that this could be phenomenal because everybody's you know just the, you know the fact that Ukraine will be in the film's title probably, and then you realize you know this this technology could have been destroyed, you know. Anyway, that's my only hope I'm holding on to with this. There's so many people that, you know, I, I've had this before and and I was a pretty social person before, but there's a lack of that now just because it's so hard for me to get out and what have you. But, um, you know, people would say, well, you know, what's wrong with them? And it, you get tired of really explaining, right? But um, to one person, to another, and especially people that aren't in the medical field, that they, they may not understand what your illness is and what have you. But lots of people have said, uh, why are you going to a country outside the U.S. for treatment? Right. And and I've had that question asked to me literally a hundred times, right? Yeah. And, and you try to explain to them, you say, listen, it, it might be only one thing, you know, I don't know if you've traveled the world or not to these people, but you might only have one perspective on it and, and your perspective may not be correct. They, they think that the best medicine is in the United States. Well, you know, Trauma medicine, yeah, probably. We probably have the best trauma medicine. Healthcare, by far. We're 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 so far behind uh, in in you know giving alternatives to to uh, to patients with with certain things that that it's it's absolutely pathetic. You know, big pharma owns owns academia, and academia owns the doctors, and it, it just it just spirals down to where you know. Uh, it, it's like, you know, it, it seems like big, big pharma government tries to, you know, hush it up, put their thumb on it, so they don't turn into a the number one pharmaceutical company. Because let me tell you something: if people got this treatment, it, you know, they probably get rid of most of the medicine in the world. No, you know what I mean. No, they're literally like that. Literally, and I've said this publicly. I mean, th- with the exception of cancer, this therapy. Uh, literally makes uh, irrelevant pretty much every pharmaceutical drug across the board as far as like anything for diabetes, anything for Parkinson's and MS and all of this stuff. Um, it's just, it doesn't, you don't need it anymore. You don't even need necessarily a half a million dollar heart transplant. Um, I filmed one of those, by the way. I have six vials of fetal heart cells right into the guy's heart. It was the same procedure as, um, you know, you would get a stint put in, a very typical procedure because the only difference is just vial after vial of fetal heart cells. But going back to people asking you, um, you know, why are you going to Ukraine? But it, it is hard to make people understand that, well, it's literally impossible to acquire fetal stem cell therapy outside of the walls of M cell, period. I mean, it doesn't matter where. You could put it on a satellite, you know. It's like, why do you need to go to a satellite? Why do you, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> that, that's that's right. what it comes down to is that it, it is not available. And it's not a matter of either or. Why are you going to this country, that country? I'm even getting emails today. I really, I don't, I really thought I've made it clear, but people are like, well, do you know, just in all your work, you know, it was just like a couple of days ago. Where else can I go to get this? Like, excuse me. Like, I mean, you cannot go anywhere else to get this. It doesn't exist. So, yeah, it's really hard yeah, for people to. But, it's really hard for people to, to wrap their heads around that. Yeah. Well, it, it is, and and it's really it's really hard uh, uh, to for people to wrap their heads around. There's another part of the world that there's just as smart and smarter people than there are there are here. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's it's uh, we're not the leader in in everything. It like a lot of people think. I mean, by far. No. Yeah. Yeah, so. I've even because I have connections with uh, it was called CERM. I mentioned that I, I interviewed them in the first movie about this uh, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And because um, I've been so sort of like desperate to kind of grasp at straws, like how can I help, you know, see if I can find a way that I can help save this. And, um, you know, I could I could I was thinking about showing them like the, the first edit of what I have in the movie and seeing if there's any way they could facilitate getting a batch of the cells out of Ukraine, bringing it here and maybe opening up clinical trials here. But I'm still going to probably approach them. Um, but the thing is, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. They would never allow a clinical trial with 24 different cell types all at once given to a human being. It's just not the way the system is designed, um, you know. And not to mention that if they realize what they have, what the Ukrainians have, 
they would also be forced to realize why are we wasting our time and money with all of these other stem cells when there's this? It's such a difficult situation to be in um, for them. Um, and I've even kind of, you know, nudge them on this. And they've just politely said, Eric, you know, there's it's really before the Ukrainian invasion, of course, and said, there's nothing we can do about this. You know, the, the abortion issue alone will stop this in its tracks. Um, it just, it's like square peg round hole, even in the stem cell world, because of the way the stem cell uh, regulatory system pipeline is set up, you know? So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's, that's, that's so sad. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's not funny, but it, it's just, um, it's so uh, hypocritical that, you know, uh, you fight for all these abortion rights, uh, but then you can't take, you know, let's just throw it in a trash can, yeah. but let's not use it, right? Yeah, 50 million of them a year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which could make a healthy population, but, you know, there wouldn't be any money except for, you know, the people doing it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's uh, it's mind boggling how how people think. Yeah. But, and then on the, on the flip side too, um, I'll say I know you know this, but um, as I'm so close to it, like you know, I, some of my films have been about like this one guy Brzezinski doing. Uh, having this really interesting invention of a cancer therapy. You know, they did everything in their power to destroy this guy. Um, he's even gone through FDA testing. He's cured a type of brain tumor in children that has never been cured in medical history. And they will not, they, they cannot stand this guy moving forward because of what it can do financially. And he's not the only one. I mean, there's another guy I was thinking about interviewing, and I still might if he'll allow me, this guy named Dr. Irving Weissman. He's a very, he's one of the America's leading stem cell experts. Um, there's an older guy now, um, I, think, I think out of Stanford, I believe, but he's gotten to the point where he's gotten up there in age where he's not afraid of sort of talking about, you know, what's wrong with the system. And this, you're talking about, I think, 15 years ago, he invented a stem cell therapy for cancer. And his first and only patient he treated is, I don't really fully, I can't remember, I'm kind of rusty on this, but he, it was a woman with deadly breast cancer. It was a specific type of breast cancer. And he tested a possibility of it's it's similar to a bone marrow transplant so it was really dangerous it's a very dangerous procedure not like m cell where they just inject you with like 40 injections or whatever yours were um you know where it's not that invasive but this is a very invasive dangerous therapy and he cured her he cured her um this is a very mainstream guy very highly respected guy not an on the fringe guy um and he cured her of, of her cancer and they would not allow him to go farther uh for the flat out because of monetary reasons. We cannot allow you to have a cure for breast cancer. This is not allowed. So, yeah. So you combine I, I, that. Yep. What's that? I, I, I believe it because yeah. it, everything, you know, all this is based on nearly every decision is based monetarily. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you're going to tell me, uh, uh, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that. But then, you're not going to stop the the people that produce foods with uh, preservative preservatives and stuff like that in them. And, and, um, you really don't care about my health, you know, <laughs> no. honestly, it's just, it's just, <laughs> it's laughable. Yeah. It's like, it's like <laughs> you, yeah, you, you, you don't care. I mean, you, you, you make drugs with crazy side effects, you know, it, that's what always gets me. I, I, I laugh. I'm like, there's only two countries in the entire world that allow um, advertisement for for pharmaceuticals, right? Mm -hmm. And U.S. is one of them. I think it's either New Zealand or Australia is the other one, one of the two. And uh, I see these commercials come on. Oh, if you have psoriasis, you can take this drug. And it shows this guy out there, oh, my, got psoriasis in my arm. And oh, my goodness, and this and that. And, and then... And then he takes this pill and, and then his whole life changes and he's out swimming with his friends and at a, at a barbecue and he's not embarrassed to take his shirt off anymore. And, and his life is totally changed. And then they go to the side effects, uh, dizzy, dizziness, drowsiness, uh, diarrhea, uh, vomiting, uh, suicidal tendencies. Uh, so what's worse, psoriasis or all these possible side effects? You know, exactly. 
And meanwhile, you know, you have side effects of fetal stem cells. Oh, better circulation. If you're a man, your libido explodes. If you're a woman, you might get pregnant more easily. Careful, you know. <laughs> oh, you feel great, <laughs> you know. Uh, you've never felt better. And um, and what are the what are the negative side effects? Uh, zero. You might have a couple of bruises from the injections. That's about it, you know. <laughs> well, I I always I always look and I, and you know my grandfather he was a he was a pattern maker engineer and um he always told me he goes you don't patch the problem okay you don't you don't fix what what uh let's say you know something's breaking on this piece of equipment you don't just make that piece stronger okay you have to look and see why is it breaking look at for the core problem for the you know what i mean and and then you'll have a solution that'll and i look at western medicine and it's like okay uh all we're doing is making these drugs to put a patch right mm -hmm. we're, we're we're patching a hole in a ship with a with a you know what's that shit you spray <laughs> yeah i know what you mean yeah yeah, yeah. uh uh the, the the guy with the crazy commercial you know that puts sprays the bottom of the boat with a screen door in it yeah 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 that, that's yeah. that's all we're doing to our health it's we're patching and patching and patching well, that's where the what, what, that's go ahead sorry no wh why can't we figure out um what the core problem is what's causing it is it is it something we're eating is it is it inflammation is it what is it you know what i mean i mean we've been at this for quite a few years now you know, I mean, why are we just coming up with with not core solutions to these core problems? You know? Sure. Well, I think that obviously is up to people like you and I. We have to we have to do it ourselves. We cannot rely on the system to uh, help us with that. But uh, but as far as like the patching of uh, like you were saying, but yeah, I mean, I've come to the conclusion after all these years of covering these subjects is that it's that is the business model. Um, that that's the most profitable model uh, to run the operation is to constantly create more patches. Um, you know, yeah, because you have reoccurring revenue, right? Yeah, because you can't. I mean, creating a solution puts yourself out of business. Like that's really hard for people to wrap their head around. Like if you are in this, a I don't know. Let's just say something simple as like coming up with a cure for cancer. If you are in the business of creating cancer therapies and then you create something that cures the whole thing, you just shot yourself in the foot monetarily. Uh, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I had one chemist that worked for pharma just explain it to me that way. I included that interview in one of my movies, but it's, it, is, it is that simple. Um, you, you cannot create a sustainable business by creating a final solution. <laughs> you cannot. It's like, right, you're, right. It's like the only way to sustain yeah, the business is to continue making patches. Yeah. They, they, they preach humanitarian efforts and, and, uh, inclusion and all this stuff. But, but, you know, you're still so crooked that, you know, you don't care about people's health, humanity. Right. right. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. It, it, that's why I, you know, I told you earlier, I don't have a lot of hope for humanity. <laughs> don't, don't, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's uh, it's crazy. But how do you get all these people to, you know, to speak out? You can't platform these people. You can't platform people that are in this daily grind of science and and uh, all these different areas. Uh, you know. By the time it, the information gets from them, it's been manipulated 10 times by the time it comes out on mass media, by marketing, by, by their own company's marketing firm, by, by other physicians, by the media, by whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what I think is so great about this platform is that uh, you can hear it from, per se, you know, the horse's mouth, yeah. right? You yeah. hear it from the person that did the study, what the study was about, why they did the study, uh, and why they what the criteria that they that, that they did the study in and why. Okay, yeah. and you know it's just like um, uh, I talk to a lot of people that I know, and they're like, uh, "Why you know why don't you trust the government, and why don't you trust these big pharma companies, and why don't you, you know?" It's not like I'm a conspiracy theorist. I I base my facts on on 
or I, I base my decisions on, on on facts, not something. Yeah, there's nothing. Tinfoil, yeah, there's nothing theoretical. Head, yeah. <laughs> there's no theory yeah. here. Yes, yeah, like it's like, yeah, that's what. Enough. Yeah, but I, go ahead. But I, I I use examples like look at big tobacco, look 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 how they manipulated science, okay, telling you how uh, their research doesn't uh, show that smoking is detrimental to your health and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And whether it is or not, I mean, you know, you can, you can twist science any way you want it. You know, there, there's a guy that, that was, uh, uh, a, a doctor that was doing a study on statins and, um, he stacked his, he stacked his, uh, um, uh, panel of, of people to show that statins work. But if you look now, over 50% of the doctors don't, don't prescribe statins because, uh, number one, it kills your, your, um, testosterone producing system. I mean, it's so many, so many things out there that have changed that people said, uh, you know, it, people, companies said that we're good for you, or this is the way it is and what have you. And, and it's, it's, it's all been manipulated and, and th that's what gets so confusing about, you know, two people and I, you know, the, the, even, even money is corruption has gotten into medical journals. You know what I mean? It's, it's oh. absolutely absurd. Oh yeah. No question. Um, oh, there's no question. My basketball game's coming on in about 10 minutes. Okay. But. Well, yeah, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. <laughs> but no, no, I mean, you asked me a question. You asked me, how do I get people to speak out? Like, what did you mean? What, what, what did you, what was your question? I'm assuming it's got to be pretty difficult for you to find people that, that want to speak out unless they're, you know, of age uh, and they have their ducks in a row financially and what have you, because they probably won't get another job. Right. And they, and then they'll be, they'll be criticized uh, by their peers, um, you know, for going against narratives. That's why you look in, you know, I, I, I listen to a lot of these pad podcasts and you listen to these scientists with phds and and you know they, they want the truth the, the ones that come out want the truth but academia fights them uh tooth and nail against academia's narrative mm -hmm. you know what i mean i mean it's it's absolutely absurd so you've got to be um you know on your part you have to verify the person's validity right make sure that they're they are who they say and you hear a lot of these guys say that that there are people say that um okay uh, i have a lot of people in academia agree with me but they won't come out against academia because where are they going to work then right yeah yeah i mean it's sort of um yeah to answer your question as far as people speaking out like with my second documentary about brzezinski it was a follow-up uh, where I was following patients in real time. The the doctors, for example, that I guess you could classify them as speaking out. When I say that, I mean, the doctors are like, I've never seen anything like this in my entire history as a physician. I've never seen this type of cancer uh, turn around or saying things like this patient will never, ever live. And then they do. Um, it's usually because they don't realize um, they just sort of just agree to the interview without really doing their homework to realize the magnitude of what they've done. <laughs> There's that. But, but I also wasn't very well known back then. Like today, like it would be very difficult. Um, it's, so it's hard to get people like to speak out um, when it comes to fetal stem cell therapy, because the people that do understand it, understand that, uh, the magnitude of it, and they would never put themselves in that position, um, to, you know, basically admit that everything we're doing in the United States as far as stem cells is a waste of time and energy and money in comparison to what fetal is. Um, but yeah, it depends um, on when you say speak out. Like my, my banking story, the Andorra Hustle, I don't know if you ever saw this. It kind of went under the radar, even though it was my most well-reviewed movie. It was quickly censored by the Spanish and Andorran government. They lobbied hard against it. Um, but everybody in there spoke out because they had nothing else to lose. I mean, they were all facing the rest of their lives in jail, and no one else was listening to what they were, what they were going through. So they, they, had no, they had nothing else to lose. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. And as far as like, but as far as like regular people like you and patients I've spoken to, 
most of them are are fine with it. You know, if anything, I just don't use their last name or I don't use their real name at all, um, just to you know, because understandably out of respect in case somebody wants to lash out at them. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Pe- people like me are incredible, though. I mean, we're you know, we we can do a testimonial, but I'm not going to tell you, you know, the science part of it. I I just like with that, you know, with the doctor. I was just curious how you got how, how you got these people to to. Uh, well, I think that's part come out because go ahead. But like during COVID, my my physician back home in Michigan, uh, great guy. Uh, I go in and see him every few months just to have him check on my health and what have you. And and we were talking. I said, "Hey, should I get a COVID shot?" And uh, he goes, well, "Paul, you've had COVID, right?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, then no." And I go, "Okay." I go what's that based on he told me all these different studies Mm -hmm. by actually john hopkins stanford harvard um cleveland clinic that state that if you've had covid uh that now you have between a six and 13 time times uh immunity or higher immunity than if you did if you got the shot right and he goes you know with your health don't take the chance of you know i wouldn't recommend you taking the chance of getting the shot because you've had COVID, but you know, that narrative wasn't out then. Now it's coming out here uh, just in the last few months. Um, But you know, in, and he goes, and he was telling me about other patients uh, that, um, you know, he, he had told um, uh, the same thing to uh, this whole family had COVID and, you know, they came in and said, hey, uh, should we get the shot? He goes, well, you know, if it's up to you. But, you know, definitely the kids are probably safe. Um, and, you know, maybe if you're older, uh, you should get the shot. But, you know, you, you guys are in your late 30s. You've already had COVID. So, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, recommend it necessarily. Well, they went and started spreading it on social media and he had to put a like kibosh on it. He goes, I got to be careful who I talk to because they have academia's got, you know, connections into the uh, physicians association. And, you know, anyone who didn't agree with their narrative was, you know, they wanted to boot out, you know, they wanted to suspend their license. A lot of that was going on. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's, also, it's um, dangerous. academia and this, the establishment, if you want to call it that, they have their own sort of hired, trolls that check out social media and see all this stuff and either report or uh, will just flat out act like a troll and fight those people. Like I dealt with a lot of that. I was really blindsided by it after my first documentary got, my first documentary sold my most popular one. And I got a chance to see it firsthand where um, everything was going fine. Everybody, you know, and all of a sudden on Twitter and Facebook, you're hit with this army of people attacking you. It was all at once. And it's very, it's no different than like you hear about the Russian trolls on Twitter, like it's in the Saudi Arabians and like, it's just, it's the same bag of tricks. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I just, I just thought that was, uh, you know, these people actually, the people that speak out, speak the truth, right? Let's yeah. make that clear. These people that speak, speak out, speaking the truth should, um, I mean, obviously, there's no award to give because, you know, but I mean, they're, they're, they should be proud of themselves. They should be good humans, you know, because, you know, the way society is now. Uh, all right. Well, if you, if you get a chance ever, I mean, you know, I mean, just, you know, maybe put me in a in a uh, group or something. If, if you ever email, you know, I'd like to know what's going on with those people. You know, I mean, if you ever get a chance. Um, yeah, I mean, why don't you just reach out every now and then and, uh, ask me, you know, and I'll let you, I'll give you the update. That's what most people yeah. are doing. Um, I try not to be gloom and doom, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah. So yeah. Um, and I try not to bother them too much because they're, you know, I don't want, I feel silly. And they admittedly said, you know, when I asked them some other questions, they were like, Eric, we cannot be bothering the staff with those kinds of questions. They're trying to save their lives right now. I was like, okay, I get it. You know? So yeah, yeah. I was gonna I, have to. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, if you know, maybe if you do 
or in contact with them and you know if they need anything or something like Thanks. that you know the maybe, latest maybe. the latest thing is um thank you like there's also a lot of other patients helping like one united kingdom family is got permission from the UK government to have one family come into their home for at least six months. There's, I'm like, that's happening. I'm spreading the word on that. The, but the biggest thing is um, anybody listening or if you know of anybody um, that could get a couple of bulletproof vests uh, to the clinic staff that are guarding the clinic, that was like their only request to me. I haven't heard any other, like, can you help me with this or that? Because there's really nothing we can do from the side of the world. But that they can't get them. They're all sold out everywhere, and it's really designated towards military. So for civilians, you know, to have a bulletproof vest, that's not easy to come by. And even my cop friends in the U.S. are like, no, Eric. I mean, there's only one bulletproof vest that can withstand an AK-47 per cop. We don't just have them lying around. But I don't know if you. I mean, you can buy them off the shelf here every day. All you need is an AR-500, like a plate carrier, a front and back plate. Right. Uh, but but the thing is, is there's going to be no way to get it there. I mean, there's. If you can, if they can, if we can get it to Poland, we can get it there. Yeah. But I think really? sending them, yeah, yeah. There, there's already supply lines and they know of somebody in Krakow that will take it to them. But it's the thing is, is that, um, I mean, g- getting people in like the general area in Poland would be easier than trying to ship it all the way from the U.S. Um, and well, then- and I think there's also uh, a residency restriction on, on plate carriers. Uh, I'll, I'll look that up, though. Because like a lot of things uh, that are made here in the U.S. that that Americans can have, you can't ship out of the country. That's the thing. Um, Yeah, there's all kinds of regulations on these things. Um, So like in a perfect scenario is like some organization, ideally in Poland, that can uh, or even Romania, you know, uh, that can, you know, that kind of like the service that you found that, you know, you paid a few hundred bucks and you got that got you out of there. If there's a service out there that will be willing to supply these. Um, you know, the supply chain route is taken care of. It's just getting a hold of them, you know? So, because if you think about it, I mean, there's plenty of EU and NATO supplies bringing military equipment in from Poland. There, there is, and even I was watching this one YouTuber in Kiev that I've been following. Uh, She was all just recently ordered clothes from Poland and had it delivered to her apartment in downtown Kiev. Uh, Are you serious? Yeah, not kidding. Um, So this is, it is, there is somewhat of a supply chain happening still coming from the West. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, let me see. I mean, worst case scenario, like I, my son just got out of the army like two years ago. Actually, he was, I, I think I told you the story about how he, his buddy is from Ukraine and um, that's how he got his U S citizenship was joining the U S military. Oh, wow. But, um, yeah. So uh, let me, let me, uh, let me get a hold of him and let him put that out on social media to yeah. to all his uh, military buddies. Yeah, you never and know. See if they just have anything laying around. You never know. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. And then we can just ship it there. Because I mean, all they're asking for is two of them. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously more would be great, but uh, you know, and they understand that this is not an easy task. But they just, you know, like, well, let me ask Eric. What the hell, you know? Yeah, I'll see what I can do. I'll, I'll have him put it out there and um, and. Uh, I'll see if uh, if anyone's got anything, and and then worst case scenario, I'll even Venmo them money, and you could give me an address that they could send them to. If if one of my friends or if one of my son's friends have something, I'll Venmo them money to ship it. Got it. All right. And you just provide me the address. Okay, you know I'll I mean? do that. Yeah, yeah. I've got all that. I won't give it to you yet until if you know you have it, because that's the other thing is trusting it's going to get there. Um, and so yeah, there's there's specific details they gave me. Um, so yeah, let's cross that bridge when we get there. If you somehow manage to get one or two or somebody does, I'll okay. let me know. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Have a we'll good talk rest. talk to you soon, Eric. Uh, absolutely, Paul. I'm glad you're home safe. All right. And, uh, All yeah. right. You take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.